A very good afternoon to you, or good evening to you, and welcome back to the St. Lucia House of Assembly, where a sitting is at the moment taking place. Uh, this morning into the afternoon, three bills were passed. The recording of court proceedings bill, the Eastern Caribbean Securities Regulatory Commission agreement, and the firearms amendment. On this, the anniversary of the election of July 26, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Philip G. Pierre, thanked the people of St. Lucia for electing the current administration to govern and pledged to continue to put the people and this country first. He also indicated that the promise to pay pensions 500 stipend is on track and that money is already in the bank. The Prime Minister also said that after consultation with the National Insurance Corporation, that corporation has agreed that the NIC pensioners also be granted an increase, 4.3% to be exact and this would be retroactive to July 1st. The speaker is back in the chamber and uh, will soon be going to him. The PM also spoke to the recording of court proceedings and uh, he was supported by the member for Viewfort North who also thanked the people of that constituency for re-electing him on this the anniversary of the election of July 26th. The speaker is about to commence the proceedings and we'll go to the speaker's chair. Good afternoon, members. When we rose for lunch, we had just concluded debate on the Firearms Amendment Act. Prime Minister and Finance Minister. The speaker, I beg to present for second reading a bill shortly entitled the Youth Economy Agency. Mr. Speaker, on on the 26th of April, Mr. Speaker, during my budget statement to this honorable house, I said the following. Mr. Speaker, one of the main challenges facing our country is youth unemployment, which remains high on the government's priority. Youth disenchantment continues to be a perennial problem with over 15,000 young people unemployed. Despite several youth-related business programs conducted by NGOs and public and private sector agencies operating in St. Lucia, it is because my administration believes that every young person irrespective of their socioeconomic circumstances, has the potential to make a positive contribution to the development of the community that we have taken up the responsibility to address the apparent deficiencies in the existing youth-related business programs. In addressing these deficiencies, my government will not duplicate exist existing initiatives, but will support the ones that work and supplement them with new and innovative ideas that, needs, that meet the needs and aspirations of the youth. In the last general election, we promised to create a special space in the economic system for young people to develop and grow their ideas, a youth economy. Mr. Speaker, the youth economy aims at transforming hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills into business by providing committed young people with finance, training, mentorship, and marketing support. The youth economy will provide support services and business opportunities for young persons with interest in activities such as sports, music, entertainment, the literary and performing arts, modeling, designing, writing and directing, agriculture, agro-processing, blue economy, and green economy. The youth economy will be managed through a statutory board with its own board of directors. 
to avoid unnecessary bureaucracy and to allow for timely decision making that is consistent with a modern business environment. The statutory board will collaborate in the formulation of outreach programs in communities with public and private sector social partners with particular emphasis given to at-risk urban and rural youth. The membership of the board of directors will be gender balanced and adequate youth rep with adequate youth representation. The statutory body will address four focal areas, training, <coughs> marketing, finance, loans and grants, mentorship. Training will consist the strengthening of existing and viable business en enterprises, identification of workable new business ideas and opportunities, research and development, innovation and technological upgrade, certification and capacity building with training in strategic planning, skill and talent development, emotional intelligence, and the implementation of international standards and best practices. Marketing to include market research, assistance with branding and packaging, to the use of e-commerce, website design development, and modernizing social media platforms, finance and grants, for the purchase of equipment for existing and viable businesses, the refurbishment of equipment and smart technologies, the provision of working capital, and support for new and emerging economic sectors in the blue, orange, and green economies. Talented youth from low-income families should not be denied the opportunity to monetize their skills because they cannot afford the necessary equipment. Talented young athletes should no longer be denied the opportunity to participate in regional and international competitions because of the lack of access to finance, to purchase sporting gear, and to secure travel arrangements. These impediments will be corrected. Mentorship. Mentorship, mentorship will cover exposure and appreciation for best business practices, the development of discipline, the need to be accountable, and the value of persistence. In keeping with the government's commitment to the young people, an amount of $10 million is provided for the youth economy under the Department of Economic Development in the estimates for 2012-2013. The youth economy is the first step in transforming solution, the solution economy driven by technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship, where young people, regardless of their socio and economic backgrounds, can become more active participants in wealth and nation building. And Mr. Speaker, this is the thinking behind the bill that I am presenting here this afternoon, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, for the let, 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 let me make it clear that the rumor that out of the ten million dollars, only two percent, only two million dollars will be used for youth programs is as usual a rumor. And I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, that in the act, in the, in the bill, on the section, on the section, can you? On the section, uh -huh. on the section 40, Mr. Speaker, you will see management of finances and application of revenue. The revenue of the agency in a financial year may be applied for the payment of interest and other charges on and the repayment of a loan payable by the agency. Remuneration payable under this act. Expenses incurred by the agency in the discharge of its functions under this act. Such expenses must not exceed 20% of the revenue of the agency without the written permission of the Minister Responsible Finance. So if the if the agency gets $10 million, 20%, you cannot spend more than 20% on administrative expenses. So your, the, the belief that only $2 million was, would be spent for, um, ex, for development is wrong. So it's clear in, in the bill. So, so uh, Mr. Speaker, this Youth Economy Act, Mr. Speaker, sets up a youth, the youth, Economy Agency, Mr. Speaker. Yep. 
And Mr. Speaker, as we said clearly, it's a statutory board that has the flexibility, the flexibility, Mr. Speaker, to run the youth economy program. It's fine. It is run. Huh? It's run by a board, Mr. Speaker, and it's also an, an evaluation committee. Mr. Speaker, I will take you to the, the board first so that we can deal with what the board ought to do, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Youth Economy Agency is run by a, a board. The functions of the agency are to implement the Youth Economy Program, to prepare and retain financial statements in respect of each financial year, to prepare a strategic plan, financial plan, operations plan, and business plans, to prepare estimates of revenue and expenditure, and to advise the minister on all matters relating to the Youth Economy Program, and to perform other functions specified in this act. That is the, these are the functions of the Youth Economy Agency, Mr. Speaker. The, the agency is run by a board, and the board comprises of the minister shall appoint five persons of the board from persons who have experience in and have shown capacity in matters relating to law, business management, career development, finance, entrepreneurship, information and communication technology, and youth development programs. The ex officio members of the board with no voting rights are the CEO and the permanent secretary of the ministry responsible for the youth economy. The minister shall designate one member of the board as the chairperson of the board, Mr. Speaker. The board is appointed for a term not exceeding three years. The functions of the board, to set the mission, values, strategic priorities, objectives, performance targets, and organizational policies of the agency. To prepare and submit to the minister a strategic plan for the youth economy program. To monitor the performance of the agency against the strategic plan. <coughs> to receive and approve applications for the youth economy program. To review the performance of the chief executive officer. To make recommendations to the minister for the development of the youth economy program. Mr. Speaker, the powers of the board, the board, the powers of the board are to appoint and determine the functions and duties of a committee, to exercise any other powers specified under this act or other enactments. And the board may, by resolution of its members, delegate, some of its, delegate its functions to one or more of its members, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the board comprises of an evaluation committee. The evaluation committee, and I'll tell you why, shall consist of the chairperson, the chief executive officer, and any other member of the board. So out of the board, three members form the ev evaluation committee. And what are the functions of the ev evaluation committee, Mr. Speaker? They are, uh, they are to review an application for access to the youth economy program, to make recommendations to the board on applicants to be considered for the youth economy program, and to perform other functions as assigned by the board. So within the board, there is an evaluation committee comprised of three people who will evaluate the proposals, the business plans, etc., that come to that come to the board, Mr. Speaker. And the evaluation committee can co-opt people from other places to help them in the evaluation of that program. Mr. Speaker, the rest of on, as it relates to the board, it deals with appointments, resignations, the, 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 the minutes of a meeting, how meetings are supposed to be, to be run, etc. These are the other functions of, of the board, Mr. Speaker. The board, Mr. Speaker, shall be run by a chief executive officer, a CEO, who will manage the day-to-day -day affairs of the agency. And the functions of the chief executive officer, the, the chief executive officer, executive officer is to implement the strategic plan and compliance initiatives set by the board and other decisions of the board, to measure and attain performance targets approved by the board, to communicate decisions of the board, policies and priorities to the employees of the agency, to present organization performance reports and estimates of revenue expenditure to the board, 
and to attend meetings of the board unless directed otherwise. So the board appoints the CEO, Mr. Speaker, who will be involved in the day-to-day -day running of the agency, the Youth Economy Agency. So, Mr. Speaker, the other sections deals with the regular functions of, of, the, of the CEO. And, Mr. Speaker, as usual, we need, accountab we need accountability for the agency. And, as I said before, the revenue of the agency can be comprises of monies raised by the agency in the form of loans, grants, investment, or the lawful means, sums allocated by the agency to the agency by parliament, and that was the $10 million that we spoke of, Mr. Speaker, and any fees that, we, that the agency may, ch may charge, Mr. Speaker. The rest, of that this, the, the, the rest of the act as it relates to the agency deals with the financial statements, Mr. Speaker. The, there must be an audit. The agency shall, within three months after the end of each financial year, have its accounts audited by an independent auditor appointed by, by the agency, shall conduct the audit in accordance with generally accepted international standards, Mr. Speaker. Then the agency shall submit to the minister a quarterly report outlining data on the youth e economy, etc., Mr. Speaker. These are the functions of the agency. Now, Mr. Speaker, you have the agency, you have the agency is run by the board and the, eva and the evaluation committee, which is part of the board. Then, Mr. Speaker, you have the youth economy program, which basically is what the, the youth economy is all about. And, and as I said before, the youth economy is designed to cause young people to convert their hobbies into entrepreneurship and their skills into business by getting involved in the youth economy program. A young person may make an application to the board to access the youth economy program. If the young person is a national, is operating a micro business enterprise for at least one year or intends, or intends to operate a micro business enterprise. Mr. Speaker, and that is important. If he intends to, if he intends to, or if he is presently in, he or she is presently in, they can apply to the youth economy program. And then he must, the, the young person must not be a bankrupt. You don't expect a young person to be a bankrupt, at least not yet. And we, and he has no outstanding tax or social security obligations. That is customary, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, the, to apply to the program, there is a form, as is said in Section 46.2, Mr. Speaker. Now, the, an application on Section 2 must be in the prescribed form, accompanied by, in the case of a micro business enterprise. That means if the business is already existing, a certificate of incorporation or certificate of registration on the Registration of Business Names Act. And that is the difference, Mr. Speaker. One of the differences. Where the value of, of the application is more than $5,000, if you are applying to the program for more than $5,000, you may have to get a banker's reference, if any. If you can't get a banker's reference, you have to produce a banker's reference. If you have financial statements, if any, you have to produce it. A business plan, if any. But, Mr. Speaker, where the value of the application is less than $5,000, if it's less than $5,000, Mr. Speaker, the only thing you have to present is the prescribed information or documents requested by the board. Now, I'll tell you why that is important, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there are many, many young people who want to go into a, a micro business. I'll give an example. Young people who do hairdressing. Young people who, who, who want to get involved in animation, in graphic designs. They need a computer, they need a dryer, they need a, a, 
a, a chair if, if they're going in, into, into hairdressing, Mr. Speaker, which costs less than $5,000. All we are saying to them is that you do not have, as a start, you don't have to get certificate of incorporation, you don't have to get bank reference. You, you can come into the agency, you will be interviewed, and once you can satisfy the agency that you have the will and the discipline and you have a certain a certain market that you can you can service mr speaker and the amount that you need is less than five thousand dollars you will get it without all the bureaucracy or all the bureaucracy all the paperwork that is needed and that is aimed specifically mr speaker at young people from the inner cities, young people with a low income, their parents could not leave anything for them, Mr. Speaker. Their parents, they haven't got anything. Their parents they don't have any money. Their parents don't have any business, but they have an idea. And the idea is, will cost less than $5,000. So youth, youth economy program will make that $5,000 available if you can follow certain criteria, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, ha having said so, if the young person is in business already and they want to get more than $5,000, the agency will help them to prepare a business plan. The agency, the agency will help them just prepare a business plan. The agency will help them to source markets and to prepare a marketing plan. And the agency will also help them in training to upscale themselves. And that has already started because there's a, there is a program being run at, at the morn for the Ministry of Commerce, Mr. Speaker, which is called Upskilling, where young people are being trained to improve their skills. I think it is in hospitality and in health, health related businesses, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, it is very important that young people who do not have what they call in, in the local language, baka, who needs little amounts of money, $2,000, $3,000, $5,000, can get it in quick time so that they can begin their small business. And from there, we, can, we will train them, we will we'll mentor them, and they can expand to get into, to, for, the, for the business to grow, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, there are certain young people, Mr. Speaker, we want, sometimes we say that young people, they're not ambitious, or they don't want to work, or they're lazy, etc. I don't think so. What I think, is that we have to find means of employment that young people want to get involved in, things that they want to do. And sometimes, n nothing wrong in working in hotels. I don't want anybody to misquote me. Nothing wrong is an honorable profession. Nothing wrong in working in call centers. They pay a decent wage. Absolutely nothing wrong in that. But there are certain, there are young people who do not want to do these kind of things. Young people who want to go into agro-processing. Young people who want to go into a different type of agriculture. Young people who want to go, right now there are many young people involved in, 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 the, in, in the bee industry, in the cultivation of bees. Young people, they want to go into that kind. They want to go into modern fishing. They want to get involved in in areas that allow them to use their own expertise, use their own skill, use their own knowledge, Mr. Speaker. So what we want to give them? We want to train them, Mr. Speaker. To promote them, young, we want to train. So the Youth Economy Program will comprise of tra a lot of training. We, we need to train them, Mr. Speaker, so that they can upskill, and as I said, that is already started in St. Lucia. We need to give them the, the, the opportunities. We came into the Honorable House and we passed a bill unleashing the Blue Economy Program. The Blue Economy is a wide area of investment that, that is possible. We hope that young people can get involved in, in, in skills, 
that, that are needed in the blue economy. Mr. Speaker, we need to organize these young people. And again, the Youth Economy Agency will help them organize, help them form into probably cooperatives, probably into small companies. They're helping them to organize so they can grow, Mr. Speaker, so they can bring their skills together and they can grow. Mr. Speaker, I'll give you an example. Every year, about a million tourists come to St. Lucia. It's about $700,000, 700,000 of them for cruise ships and about 300, about, about a million come to St. Lucia every year, on average. There are several things that we can offer these tourists that can make them leave more of that money into St. Lucia. The Minister of Tourism has been lamenting and the tourism industry how the money, a lot of the money leaves, in, leaves St. Lucia, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The youth economy, and I'm sure there are young people, I'll give you an example. In the business of hair braiding, Mr. Speaker, the amount of, there are many tourists who want to braid their hair like locals. We can, what do these young people need? Probably an, a chair, a comfortable chair, probably or something of that nature. The youth economy can help. In the business of massaging, what do they need? A, a table, we can assist, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the business of manicuring and pedicuring, just think about it. How would it be if a tourist comes and a young person can put on their fingernails a little map of St. Lucia? Or like a flag like what I have on me there. You, you can imprint it on their, on, their, on, their, on their nails. Because young people, the people have long, long nails, so you put St. Lucia on the end. Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure with support and the, because our people, our young people are very, very, very talented. What they need is support, Mr. Speaker. And they really don't need a lot of money, you know. They need support, they need direction, and they, and they need training, Mr. Speaker. In, the, in, in, in modern, modern, Mr. Speaker, I mean, all of us will agree that St. Lucia has many attractive young, 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 young ladies. <laughs> what you laughing at? <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the member we put now from um, um, uh, Nov. That's a, that's a Muslim. <laughs> uh, there are many, there are many very attractive young ladies in San Lucia, and and I may say, and I may say, not only young ladies, Mr. Speaker, young men too, men modeling too. You understand? So we can develop a serious modeling agency with, 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 with these young people. Last, there was a, a program, export, export the runway, Mr. Speaker. Look at the talent. What about, what about all these designers? These designers, these people, we can, the youth economy can encourage them again the necessary finance and helping them, creating opportunities for them, Mr. Speaker, creating avenues for them to reach global standards. Sports, Mr. Speaker, sports. We have to start to look at sports now as an, even as an export crop. Because there are a number of leagues all, all, all over the world. Football, cricket, some of them basketball. Mr. Speaker, something, last year, last year, a young man came to us, Mr. Speaker. He got a professional contract to play in France, to play basketball in France, Mr. Speaker. But because he wasn't fortunate, he didn't have anybody to give him any backer, he could not, his coach told him, once he gets to France, he will pick him up and he'll take care of him. Just has to get to France. He couldn't afford to get to France. He didn't have the money to get to France, Mr. Speaker. So what we are saying is we'll treat that as an economic an economic issue, and it can come into the youth economy agency, and probably, and that is why we've we've put the five thousand dollar limit. He can come and probably get a ticket for him to go to France to play basketball. And these are the ways, Mr. System, it is we want to change people's lives, Mr. Speaker. So we wanted to cut the bureaucracy. We want to cut off some of the bureaucracy that exists for young people because young people get frustrated. 
And only some time ago, we were speaking about the banks. Where to open a bank account, you need two forms of ID. So we want to cut off some of the frustration. And that is why, for the, because $5,000 may sound as nothing. But for many young people, if they had $5,000, that would give them a serious start for what they want to do. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we are making these changes or making or initiating that, Mr. Speaker. The business of incentives, Mr. Speaker. Every day, we give incentives to all kind of, all, all developers. We wave that, we wave, not, nothing wrong in that. They say we have to create the enabling environment for investment, Mr. Speaker. But what about a young person, Mr. Speaker? This bill says, this bill says that if a young person wants to go into a business and the value of the incentives that he needs is less than $20,000 or less, the agency can award these incentives, Mr. Speaker. You don't have to go to cabinet, etc. Can be awarded, the agency can be awarded, these incentives can be awarded to the young person if they want to bring in something, except things like motor vehicles, we won't give you that. But if you want to bring equipment or you want to bring, you pay, we'll get you instantly. Once it's approved, instantly you're going to get duty-free concessions. If it's, if it's above that, then you have to go through the, the, the normal procedure, Mr. Speaker. And what are these exemptions? 100% customs duty exemptions on imports, including fixtures and footage and fittings. 100% duty exemptions on imports of alternative energy and energy saving equipment devices and fittings used for the approved UV economy project. 100% exemption from the payment of value added tax on building material, equipment and locally produced art and craft. 100% exemption from payment of corporation tax. Speaking about arts and craft, Mr. Speaker, the whole business of, of, of arts, of craft, we, I think in the last time we were in the House, we spoke about craft in Shozel, Mr. Speaker. We know, again, we want to make it attractive for the young people so that they can get involved in, to bring it to a different level. Take it from where their parents had it and bring it to, to a different level, Mr. Speaker. We saw what can happen with bananas. And it is very unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, that some members of the opposition and the surrogates thought it was good, it was nice to make, to believe that they were trying to create, make an image of me that I was somehow not correct when I spoke about bananas, Mr. Speaker. They try to ridicule me when I speak about the bananas. Mr. Speaker, if you see the amount of products that that exhibition showed that bananas can do, Mr. Speaker, you will be surprised. The amount of bananas. So, and that is what, but what do these people need? What do they need? It's just some working capital. Probably a little piece of equipment, Mr. Speaker, and they can, can, can convert these bananas, they can add value, Mr. Speaker. You see, we must have confidence in ourselves and confidence in our young people. And we have to give them, create the environment for them, Mr. Speaker. We have to facilitate them, Mr. Speaker. We have to help them so that they can go forward. Some of them will make mistakes, Mr. Speaker. Some of them will make mistakes. Multi-million dollar businesses have started, they failed, and we help them. We create an opportunity for them, Mr. Speaker. What must happen is that when a young person makes a mistake, especially when it's a mistake made in business, Mr. Speaker, we must not treat them as if they are outcasts and as if they are failures. And that is the mistake we make all the time. Mis a failure in business, once you don't have backer, and once you don't have name, when you fail in business, they ostracize you. We need to change that, Mr. Speaker, because I'm sure there are many young people out there. And I, and I don't want anybody to tell me that exists already. They have incentives, tourism incentives, act, and, and micro business. And that, that's, it. that's the argument that I'm going to hear. That I, no, it doesn't exist yet. This is specialist. This is special for the young people of this country. It's special for them, Mr. Speaker. We don't want to get them. We know that there's micro business acting, which is good. But we want the young people to have their own space, their own space in the economic 
in the economic sphere. They need to have their own space, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, there are different types of businesses, and the program will accept and organize all of them. This is why it says it co opts the board to look for expertise in other areas, Mr. Speaker. There are businesses that are less than a year old. They need a different kind of treatment. So businesses that exist already, Mr. Speaker. Let's go in, into the business of designing, Mr. Speaker. Um, we can create a unique St. Lucian design. We can create our own designers. What do they need? Probably a computer, probably a machine. Probably they can take it to another level, Mr. Speaker. And that's what the youth economy aims at. That is what the, youth, the agency will do, Mr. Speaker. Get young people to have more confidence in themselves, in themselves, uh, Mr. Speaker. Both if you're not in business yet, and if you want to get into business, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, there is a large area of e-commerce and digital technology. Every young person has some form or has some knowledge in the digital economy, Mr. Speaker. But what, do we do? what happens? They can convert that into a business. We must create an, an enabling environment by making sure there's access to broadband services. But what do they need? They need, they need a computer, etc. So there are many people, young people, who can stay at their home and plug in to places in, in America, as far as India, and work from their home if they have necessary equipment for the digital economy. And that is what we want to create. These are the kind of entrepreneurs that we want to create, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the, operating, the, the operating model for the youth agency, Mr. Speaker, is we have to ensure that the, the capabilities of young people are taken into consideration. We have to make sure that there's a proper structure and a proper governance. Because you can't run any, any agency or any business if there's not structure and governance. And we have to instill that discipline in our young entrepreneurs very early that your profit is what you make after you've taken out your expenses. That structure, that discipline, and, and, and that is why there's going to be the education, the training, and training is an important component because you may be a young person and you may have a business, and for the first year, you have the sales are good. But what do you do? You take it and you put it in, in consumption. No, you mustn't do that. And that is where, that's the training that will come. And this is why there's, there are going to be mentors to mentor these young people. Successful, honest businessmen. Stress the word honest. Successful, honest businessmen who have gone into business and who have succeeded. We can use them as mentors for these young people. And I'm sure there are many people who will want to do that. Business. Music. Mr. Speaker, during the... the, the the, the, the economic crisis. Jamaica survived on, on the music, on music, on exporting music, Mr. Speaker. Music, again, is an export industry. We have the Denry segment. We can develop that business, we can develop that, 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 musical, that musical talent, Mr. Speaker. The, what, what about all the cultural activity that we have? Have we really, and I know again, tourism is work, have we really taken our creative industries, and that is where young people are, and really made it into a business venture, creating dollars from our creative industries. Have we really done that? Have we really given the, the, the entertainment that tourists need, Mr. Speaker? Just, just very quickly, the, the, the cruise ships come to St. Lucia, and then they, 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 they drive to Viewfort, the Sufre to look to for, for, for the Sulphur Springs. Can we not, in a very succinct way, create probably 
an enactment of the Laos Festival, and you, 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 you package it in 20 minute segments and you present to, to tourists with a little history of what that, 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 that is all about, Mr. Speaker. These are the things that we want to inspire our young people to do, Mr. Speaker. And that is the purpose of the Youth Economy Agency, to create that environment to give young people only. And young people there are people with, with, who are less than 35 years old. That is the people that we, we, we call that we call young people as far as that bill is concerned, Mr. Speaker. People are less than 25 years old. And so we want to put them in their own space. We are, right now we are in the process of preparing the office, Mr. Speaker. And the office has to be young. It's got to be a young office. It's got to be an office where you have vibe in there. Vibe and, huh? Agile and flexible, Mr. Speaker. Right. Flexible and agile, Mr. Speaker. So because, you know, I will hear the argument that that exists already, that's nothing new. I hear that, that's, that's our grips. <coughs> what I'm saying is this is the first time we're going to have a dedicated agency for the young people of St. Lucia. First time, Mr. Speaker. So, so, Mr. Speaker, young people are very excited about it. And, they, they're very excited about it, Mr. Speaker, because they yearn for something of that nature. They yearn to get into business. And we must ask ourselves, if we have all these established things working, all these things that we say we form, all these things we have, and then we have not got the benefits that we intend to get, why can't we change something? Why don't we do something new? Because we have all of them. We have all these things that, that we say we have. Maps and naps and all these things that we say, yeah. But why haven't we got the returns? And we, this is, to our mind, a dedicated agency dealing with leadership, financial management, business strategy, operational efficiency, <coughs> sales and marketing, and human resources, all designed and designated for young people only. Working with young people, but being very transparent and accountable. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that we will see many young people converting their hobbies into entrepreneurship, Mr. Speaker, and their skills into business so they can create employment for themselves and develop and I make no bones about it. We need to develop a new cadre of indigenous business people. And this is not being, this is not being insular or what do you use any other word you want. It is to develop a local person, Mr. Speaker. We need to see people who live in the parts of St. Lucia that you all think and not think. We need to see them have businesses. We need to see them from Bellevue and from Marchand and from Bapatat and from Fuller Show. We need to see them have businesses. We need to give them opportunity to create, to use their talents and their skills, Mr. Speaker. And I make no bones about it, Mr. Speaker, because all we do is that we, we just castigate people and put them in a the corner because they have no name. Everybody has a name, Mr. Speaker. Everybody has a name. What you must do is you have, you have to be given the opportunity to develop your name so that you can make a contribution to yourself and your society, Mr. Speaker. And that is what we hope. We hope this is the first step. The, the initial financing, Mr. Speaker, is $10 million. That's the initial financing. But the, the Taiwanese for the upskilling program, they, they will work with us, Mr. Speaker. What we intend to do is all the youth programs, we intend to build it under one umbrella, Mr. Speaker. We intend to work with the Ministry of Agriculture, young people in agriculture, but bring them under one agency, the Ministry of Tourism, Mr. Speaker. We intend to, to work with them to create employment for young people in one economic space designed for the young people's solution. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. <coughs> Honorable members, the question is that the Youth Economy Bill be read a second time. 
Member for Castry South East. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I think today I must add my voice and say it's a glorious day. It is a very good day. For this piece of legislation, this bill, and the idea that we're going to be creating space for young people. Mr. Speaker, as I listen to, the, to our Prime Minister, give the details of what this is about. I am sure members on the opposite side will want to debate the details. But I would say to them, Mr. Speaker, and I would say to everyone who is listening, that is the idea the idea that our young people need to have an economic space is novel. This is first time, and this is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for young people. And I'll say why, Mr. Speaker, because I want to make use of the survey of living condition and the household budget survey of 2016. <laughs> yes. And of course, in 2016, the survey of living condition highlighted that our labor force being 144,000, of which only 78% were participating. Therefore, you had unemployment in about 21%. And when you pay attention, and of course, Mr. Speaker, let me explain this, the household budget survey. Between November of 2015 to July 2016, the consultants remain with 1,433 homes monitoring the expenditure during those months, what they were consuming, how they were living, to establish this very important poverty report. And when you see the number of persons participating in the job market, in the labor force, we recognize the high unemployment rate with our youth or young people. And every year, as persons leave school, that number continues to grow. So our youth unemployment is high. One may ask the question, like the Prime Minister said, but we have, we have um, concessions here. We have um, support over there. But there comes a time in your intervention where you need to focus, where you need to be deliberate, where you need to be purposeful. And of course, in this intervention, it's not just an economic intervention, but there is a safety net. Because when it comes for participating in the business of St. Lucia, when it comes for who participate in business or who have access to services of government, Mr. Speaker, there's always a fortunate few. There's always some individuals who are more able to access. And when an, in an initiative like this youth economy comes on board. I am sure over the years it will evolve and you will hear more about it. But there's something special about the Labour Party government. Because all of these agencies that are responsible, that is providing safety nets to our people, all of the agencies that is responding to our vulnerable population was established by the Labour Party administration. You talk about the National Conservation Authority. You talk about the St. Lucia Social Development Fund. You talk about the James Belgrave Fund that's doing microenterprise. We are in the business of always recognizing our vulnerable population and attempt to address issues specific to a special group. And this, this is vital, Mr. Speaker, because we may ask where else in the region has someone given consideration that there should be a youth economy? One may ask, isn't, there, isn't it a general economic activity of everybody participating? Of course, yes, that exists. But why do we have a high rate of unemployment among our youth? And shouldn't that be a concern when we have to come here and pass a firearms bill to increase and deter young people from violent crime? Shouldn't it be appropriate also to consider how do you address the issue of our youth in the economy? And this is what I think persons should pay attention to. And I commend the Prime Minister for having the vision. 
and even if it's not accurate and it is not perfect in its presentation, the board of directors who will lead this organization will have it to evolve and respond to what young people want. And this is what I believe in. Because we are able. We have done it before and we'll do it again. So I commend, and let me say this, Mr. Speaker, in the survey of living condition, if you look at the, um, the issue in terms of unemployment and educational attainment, you notice that even while persons have increased in education, especially among the women, you still find high unemployment. So, so the gender sensitivity is an issue as well. So you have now persons with degrees, unemployed. The Prime Minister is saying that the youth economy will target these individuals. Mr. Speaker, I sit in a parliamentary office like most of my colleagues, and most of you would agree with me that most persons come to the office coming, sometimes coming to look for a handout they would need to, they need some support. They cannot help to address the immediate need. When you have a youth economy, it will now start to cause young people to start to think because on the menu of service, it's not just that we have educational assistance, it's not just that we are providing support to the senior persons, but now we have on the menu a youth economy and we're engaging young people to come forward with your thoughts. Start to think, because there's business opportunity. And of course, when you look at the issue of the structure of our economy, a few businesses continue to dominate us as a country. Look. Do us, do, go through the land registry and find out who owns the city of Castries. How many local St. Lucians own properties and business in the city of Castries? Go up Grosile, find out who own businesses in that part of the island. How many locals own? We're not. And if we maintain the status quo and the business as is, we will be selling ourselves and our future and we as St. Lucians will disappear as significant persons in the participation of the economy of St. Lucia. The youth economy is an important seed for transformation of the economy. It ties in with the SDGs because one of the commitments made on, on one of the six pillars is to support our SMS, SMMEs, our small micro-businesses. This is one of the strategies right in our SDGs. The Prime Minister is on point. The Labour government again is de delivering in a fundamental way to shape the minds of young people, to tell them that they need to participate in the economic business of this country. And of course it will do well for the future of this country. So I ask members of the opposition, spare not to think of the details because the able men of St. Lucia, uh, men and women of St. Lucia will sit to govern this agency, will continue to lead it to where it ought to go and bring it into good, safe, comprehensive and productive harbors. But give your support to this initiative because it will do well for our children and your children. I thank you. The member for Swaziland Saltibus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Uh, my good friend, my good friend. Uh, it should be the intention of every government. It should, uh, I agree with you. It should be the intention of every government, Mr. Speaker, to assist and empower the people of the country, especially young people. Okay? And, and Mr. Speaker, based on the intention of this act, it's a no-brainer that it should be supported across the board. Don't, don't boo me for my next statement. <laughs> However, Mr. Speaker, I listen, I listen closely to the Honorable Prime Minister in his opening remarks, when he was reading from his um, address, budget address, and he said, um, my government will not duplicate anything that's working. Pretty much that's, that's what he said. And that, that is the fundamental problem I have with 
why we establish a youth economy agency. That is a fundamental problem I have, Mr. Speaker. Because, Mr. Speaker, I believe we have several agencies already in place delivering a range of similar programs. We have the Small Business Development Center, we have the Ministry of Commerce, we have Bell Fund, we have SLDB, the Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Speaker, there's the Youth Business Trust Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship Program. All of these entities, Mr. Speaker, are already in operation. They have an operational structure, Mr. Speaker. They have history, they have experience, they have the expertise in providing the service. They also, Mr. Speaker, have a need for additional resources to expand and enhance the current offerings, Mr. Speaker. So the question is, has any attempt been made, Mr. Speaker, to assess these agencies and the associated programs that they currently have? Have we, be, have we identified the major, the major gaps that, 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 that currently exist? Have we identified ways, Mr. Speaker, to address these gaps? Has there been any attempt made to enhance the existing agencies involved in the delivery of sustainable business support services? And what sets this new agency apart from what already exists, Mr. Speaker? I, the question is, is, is the government saying that there are no agencies in place currently that supports youth participation in the economy? Okay? So, Mr. Speaker, the, 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 one of the things, Mr. Speaker, that I'm, I'm, I, I have a, a critical problem with, Mr. Speaker, is, uh, again, as I said, government is continuing. And you know, it would have been nice for the Honorable Prime Minister to indicate that, um, you know, uh, he appreciated the foundation that was set for this program that he's, he's currently implementing. And why I say that, Mr. Speaker? Why I say that, Mr. Speaker? Because you would remember, and Madam Minister of Commerce would, would know that because she's um, coming in right after me, um, that when we adjusted the Fiscal Incentive Act, Mr. Speaker, there were a number of things that were put in place for the services sector. And the services sector is a lot of what our young people are currently engaged in. Before what we had, we had most of the incentives going to the tourism sector, the agricultural sector, and the manufacturing sector. What did we do, Mr. Speaker? We amended the Fiscal Incentive Act to capture five new sectors. Professional sector, and we listed the agencies under the, the, the various professions. The creative sector, which a lot of emphasis is currently being spoken about based on this youth economy. The IT sector, Mr. Speaker. Spa and wellness sector. All of these sectors have already, under the amendment to the Fiscal Incentive Act now, will be able, Mr. Speaker, to get income tax holidays. The, the, the Minister, Prime Minister spoke a bit about it service charge exemptions, import duty exemptions, excise tax exemptions, VAT and tax credit, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. So this is something, Mr. Speaker, you could well imagine that the youth economy that's been proposed will be able to piggyback on significantly, Mr. Speaker. So, no, I, no, I am saying that it, it, it exists, it exists. And my, my, my good friend, you know, we always address each other like that, Mr. Speaker. I remember very early when you came, family, <laughs> very early when you came in. Is that an 18th member of the house, your good friend? Well, uh, well you, know, you, know, you know he has true cell connections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when he came in office, I remember, I can't remember the, the occasion, but he was speaking about the things, the programs that he found at Invest and Lucia that he was very impressed with. And in his words, he felt that they needed some tweaking to, you know, to work with, I guess, his own thinking. And one of the programs you found, uh, um, my good friend, was the Boost program. And you know, Invest and Lucia spent $200,000, to which the young people were the ones who created that program, more or less. And Surprisingly, I'm not hearing anything how it fits into this new youth economy. And I, I really wish, and, and I'm sure um, the, the member knows 
you know, the value of that program. And, and it's something that should be, you know, highlighted. I, I, the, the member from Castro South is indicated, um, you know, we should not go into the details, but I think it's important that we recognize some of the, 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 the things and the talents that already existed and how we can, you know, um, bring it into, into, this, into this program. Um, sadly, Mr. Speaker, there's something that continues to bother me and, and, and you know, on the, on the political lines, Mr. Speaker, it always seems to be getting a very bad rap, Mr. Speaker. And as the whole issue of the Ojo, Ojo Labs and the ITELBO, Mr. Speaker, which is playing an important role in the south of the island, the number of people that are being employed, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, um, I think we need to forget about some of the criticisms that have been, been laid and look at, you know, the number of jobs that are being created and the young people that are being empowered, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure the Honorable Member for Viewfort South and also Viewfort North Library, all of, the, all of them have our people, you know, gainfully employed. And one of the things we need to do is to preserve jobs. So it was a very sad day for me, and I, I would like to mention that, that when they were opening their third unit, you know, I, I did not see any member from the government side. And I, I thought that was, you know, very unfortunate. I think it was something that, you know, they, they, they should show support to the young people. You know, you, you were invited. Uh, there's a member who was in, in, in the gallery who's not there right now. But they were, they were invited. Well, there was an apology on behalf of the Prime Minister, for sure. There was an apology. Okay? So, um, my, the, 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 the Prime Minister spoke that um, 20%, I think you mentioned 20%, should not be spent in administrative um, expense. But, Mr. Prime Minister, you would remember in the budget, there was the line that showed under the $10 million and Almost $5 million will be going to operational expense. We saw before. that, and we spoke about that. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay, well, so you, so you clarify that now, but because it's a major concern that $5 million, you know, would have to, be, would have to go into, into such a way where that can be used to assist young people. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to go through some parts of the, the act um, um, that... that, that I think um, we should, in this environment currently, I think um, we see a lot of the scrutiny that our lending agencies come under and all of what they have to live up to based on international standards and everything like that. And I think to create another lending agency, because in part, the, the, the agency is going to be a sort of a lending agency as well, you know. The, the amount of bureaucracy and, and, and administrative, you know, um, um, components to it, I think, you know, you know going to that um, um, component of it, you know, is something that we should look very closely at. Um, you know, we have the, we have the SLDB, we have the, we have the Bell Fund, as I said, doing that. Mr. Speaker, I also, I also note under Clause 57, monitoring of compliance. And that's where I come to the whole issue of duplication again. 57.1 and 57.2. The ministry shall monitor compliance by a young person. Exchange. That's one of You have changed it about yeah. five times. In one week. So regarding the public officer from the ministry, it's also, <laughs> abs it's not there as well? Okay, so the, everything will be done in-house. Okay. Well, you know, that's what happens when you get these things late. You know, I, I, it's true you brought to my attention, but all my notes are on that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, Mr. Speaker, um, the, the Prime Minister seemed to have clarified the issue that I had with regards to the 50% I'm going into admin. But as I indicated, Mr. Speaker, earlier, I think the intention of the Act is a good one. My, 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 my concern has been whether there are some resources that are not, going, are not wasteful, Mr. Speaker. The other issue I have, Mr. Speaker, just in, in closing, is how do we reach out to people in the out districts like my community, Shuzel, Saltibus, Mr. Speaker, where I have a young people, where how I have, um, I, have, I have young people, I have a young man only yesterday who, who um, Member for he has a um, very seldom do I set rules there, but in this chamber, there is no out district. Out. Every one of the 17 members here are equal. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. I appreciate your, your reminding me on that. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, so, a young man yesterday came to me, and um, he has he has a wonderful um, pizza dough that he, that he, that he, that he um, and, and Mass is prepared to purchase. But what are you telling him? You need to have a separate outhouse or building to, to do that. You cannot do it. You know, when he goes up and he says, "Boy, well, he's from Shozel, will he be marginalized? You know, these are the questions that, you know, I, I, I want to ensure that this thing is going to take into consideration young people regardless of where they come from. And even if they're recommended by the minister of Shozel, you know, that it will not be seen as, you know, we have to stop this divide that we have. And, and, and appreciate that. You see, you're a fellow lion and you seem to be attacking me, you know. Take it easy, yes? Yeah? You're a fellow lion. Lion, lion. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, um, so this was my concern, Mr. Speaker, but um, I, as I said, I, I support the intention, and I'm hoping that some of the concerns that I raised would be addressed. Thank you very much. The member for Miko North. Oh, Mr. Speaker, see me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I did not come into this house with any intention on speaking on this bill. Um, but earlier, I mentioned that. I mentioned the word young, Mr. Speaker, and the member for Denry North found it necessary at the time to see. I do not know if he jed or ched. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, I felt compelled being the youngest parliamentarian in this honorable house to stand and offer my support to this youth economy bill. And Mr. Speaker, I listened to the Prime Minister in his presentation, the member for Castries East. And I really reflected on my own life and on my own self growing up as a young man. And I sat there in the chair and I imagined the possibilities that I could have benefited from if during my time, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, there was a youth economy that was built, and I know that the member for Chosel said that there are other um, agencies who do similar or who provide similar support. But to have a youth economy, Mr. Speaker, just by the very name, Mr. Speaker, I think that it encourages young people to know that you have somewhere that you can call yours. It is youth specific, it is youth driven, and I think the Prime Minister said that um, even the configuration of the office will be one whereby we have young people who understand the plight of other young people doing the representation on their behalf and assisting and doing the works, the administrative works at the office. And Mr. Speaker, I remember during the election campaign, quite a few people looked to me up to me, quite a few young people came and they asked me questions. What is your government going to do? If you all win the election, what are you all going to do about young people? And at the time, Mr. Speaker, I did not have a comprehensive understanding of what the youth economy was. Um, but just by the name, the very name, Mr. Speaker, I was in a position to be able to sell that to young people. And having seen the bill, Mr. Speaker, now I'm even more excited. I'm even in a better position. To tell people like Oshun, Mr. Speaker, that there is a real opportunity for her. Not everyone, Mr. Speaker. I know, I remember when I left school, not every one of us will have the same opportunities. Not all of us here have the backer. And I think one of the things that is even more exciting about the bill is that the persons behind the bill or the other parliamentarians like ourselves, they understand what it is not to have backer. They understand what it is to grow up and not to have somebody behind you with a nene or a power or not to carry a certain surname, Mr. Speaker. And for it to be denied an opportunity because you don't have the necessary backing. That is a problem that is going to be eliminated by this bill, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, as I said, I remember when I left school in 2007, 2009, Mr. Speaker. 
<laughs> so long ago. <laughs> yes, Mr. Sugar, when I left school in 2009, I remember coming from fresh out of Safa. And because my mother was not, or she did not have a prominent surname, I grew up more or less without the support of a father or a father figure in my life. It's just because I found it very difficult. Very, very, very difficult. And today, earlier, I made a presentation on the firearms bill and some of the, the things that can lead to young people going astray. And Mr. Speaker, I, when I think of myself, I could have gone astray at any given time, during the time that I left school and during the time that I became a police officer. Uh, because there were times when I was hopeless. Because I felt like I did well at school and persons who did not perform as well as I did, I saw them working in the banks and working various places, Mr. Speaker. And not because of merit, and we can, I think all of us can attest to the fact that some of us find ourselves in positions not because of merit, but because of, as the Prime Minister used the word, who we have behind us, or who we know. Now, <clears throat> now, Mr. Speaker, I found, I remember, there were several things that I wanted to do. I had all the bright ideas in my mind at that time. However, there was not really an avenue where I could have gone, or there was an agency that I could have gone to at the time that would have given me an opportunity, or would have given me seed capital. And seed capital is very, very important for a young person just coming out of school. You have not worked anywhere, Mr. Speaker. You don't have any money saved in the bank, especially, as I said, those of us without a bank, you have not worked anywhere, and you don't have any money to go. And you may have all the bright ideas, and without the seed capital, there's very little to nothing that you can do as it relates to exploring or, or, or developing whatever potentials that you may have, the hobbies, the skills. Mr. Speaker, I support this bill. I'm very happy that today we are passing this bill in this honorable house. And I say that because I have right here in my community and my constituency, I want to encourage persons like Peter, Peter Noel, who have gone into the business of agro-processing. And now they produce banana flour, cassava flour, um, just name it, breadfruit flour, um, CMOS powder, CMOS capsules, and they've been struggling, Mr. Speaker, because of how expensive it is to be able to buy equipment, um, to be able to buy fittings for just an office. And this, with this bill, Mr. Speaker, with the passing of this bill, Peter and Noel now have Taisha and her partner now have an opportunity to be able to bring the equipment that they require for the agro-processing, to be able to bring it here and not worry about heavy custom duties. Now they have an opportunity to bring these things here duty-free. And that is what progressive thinking is about. I mean, we have to be realistic. We have a situation where not everyone now, Mr. Speaker, or those people who we term, quote-unquote, academically inclined, are not we have a situation or a trend where not all these people are now interested in becoming doctors and lawyers, Mr. Speaker. Some of them are interested in becoming entrepreneurs. We have a General Bix, Mr. Speaker, and those of you remember the song, Bofe Lili, Bofe Lo, Mr. Speaker. That's from the General Bix in Mikud. And Mr. Speaker, can you imagine how far General Bix could have been? With just a little push, with something from the youth economy, Mr. Speaker. We have Mahon James Mogli, who produces, Mr. Speaker, in the community of Mikwood. Right there, he produces. He has his own little studio inside his house. And several young men and women keep going to the studio, and they keep recording there. And Mr. Speaker, I say, imagine this man has done so much on his own. He's a teacher, and he has done so much on his own. With a little incentive, you can think of the limitless opportunities that he can give, not just to himself as a young businessman, but to other burden entrepreneurs, to burden artists in the community. Now they have an avenue where they can go, they can record, and we can ensure that he has the proper equipment to provide proper music and to give other young people in the constituency of Mikwood an opportunity. So when I think of these things, Mr. Speaker, I'm left with no choice but to support this youth economy bill. I have to support this youth economy bill. When I think of my own trials, my own struggles, Mr. Speaker, and I thank God for preserving me and ensuring that I stayed along the right path. But not all of us are so lucky. And Mr. Speaker, I see this youth economy bill working alongside 
the firearms, the, the amendments to the firearms bill, where it's going to, it gives us an opportunity. This morning we said that we need a holistic approach. Uh, it's no longer just about implementing legislation to make laws stiffer for our people, but giving them an opportunity where they can go and they can explore. We have an opportunity where they can go there and they get the exposure that they need to display their skills, their hobbies, and to give them it at a very young age. And I'm very happy with the component, the training component involved there. Even things like upskilling, Mr. Speaker, I want to support initiatives like the upskill initiative with the Taiwanese. And I think that these things, especially given the time that we're operating in, Mr. Speaker, I think I want to applaud the Prime Minister and the government for seeing the need to bring this bill before the House. And as much as the member for Shozel said that there are other agencies which um, provide similar services, Mr. Speaker, I think having a bill or having an agency that deals specifically with the young people, Mr. Speaker, that alone will attract our young people. I think that alone will allow our young people to see that the government is really interested, that we're not just talking the talk, but we're walking the walk. And that is why we made that manifesto promise. And I'm happy that today, on our first year anniversary, Mr. Speaker, that we're able to pass this bill and to give the young people in St. Lucia a real opportunity. And some may say, but what is $5,000? Mr. Speaker, I can tell you, $5,000 is a lot of money when you don't have money. $2,000 is a lot of money when you don't have money. $2,000 can save a man's life. A young man who may be going astray, may be talented in barbering. Just the fact that you give him that chair and the first set of clippers to start, Mr. Speaker, you've set the foundation for him for the rest of his life. And I refuse, I, Mr. Speaker, not every bill will have its deficiencies, and I accept that. But I refuse if a bill is so important with a bill that proposes to do so much for the young people in St. Lucia. I don't think, Mr. Speaker, that we should look at deficiencies in the bill today. I think today, the general sentiment in this room should be one of support. One where we understand that our young people, all of us know all too well, Mr. Speaker, that we have a problem, even under the last administration, with youth unemployment. We understand that we have a problem with youth unemployment. There is no way that the public service can absorb the young people outside. There is no way. There is no way that we can take more teachers and more doctors. We've, uh, we, I think we've reached our quota. And when you look at the amount of people retiring vis-a-vis -vis the amount of children leaving school, Mr. Speaker, we would always have a problem of youth, for, of youth unemployment. But this gives us an opportunity to change things. This creates the paradigm shift that we're looking for, where young people now get that opportunity to go there and create their own employment. And Mr. Speaker, even for community tourism, I can see this bill meshing so well with community tourism, and I'm, I know that very soon I will be seeing aspects of community tourism coming to Mikud North. And having said that, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the young people in Mikud North who are involved in the arts and the crafts, those who want to learn how to do um, um, chapeau pie, as they call them, the straw hats. Mr. Speaker, the youth economy gives these people an opportunity. And I heard the Prime Minister made mention of a young man who wanted to go to France, and he had an opportunity to go to France, and all he needed at the time was a ticket. And just and through the youth economy, he has an opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to go there, get his ticket, and it provides him with the type of employment. He goes to France or wherever, he works or he plays football, he becomes professional, or he, even if he does not become professional, Mr. Speaker, his family is going to be benefiting from remittances. And you can see, Mr. Speaker, the amount of opportunities that can come from this piece of legislation that we're going to pass in this house today. And when the Prime Minister spoke about that, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you about, I have at least 20, during my tenure, my one year, Mr. Speaker, I have in, in excess of 20 of my constituents who have left St. Lucia and who have gone to the British Army to work because they find it very difficult to get work in St. Lucia, especially given the COVID times. And we've had to provide support to these people one way or the other. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy that I now have somewhere to direct these young people to go. I can send them to the youth economy, to the youth agency, Mr. Speaker, who, are, who is going to provide support for them in that regard. That is one less headache for me as a parliamentarian for Mikud North. So, there is, so Mr. Speaker, I, I cannot find the real words to express how excited I am about this bill and about what this bill is going to do for the young people of St. Lucia. So in closing, I just want to thank the Prime Minister and the, my other parliamentarian colleagues for supporting this bill, Mr. Speaker, and I want to encourage the young people, especially those young people 
between the Tumasi Bridge and the Prale Bridge, Mr. Speaker. I want to send a very special message to them to the, for, so that they can make optimum use of this opportunity that has been afforded to them through this youth economy bill. So I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister for bringing this bill to the House. Member of Grosley, not Grosley, <laughs> Sufre, sorry. I accept, Mr. Speaker. This is the member for Sufre for Shejak, as well as the member for Grosley. I accept. I still represent. <laughs> oh, the red, oh, that's that was that's when you a bit, Mr. Speaker. It was not sure, you know, okay. <laughs> and GM is always on GM, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I've sat here today. <laughs> today, today, today is not the day. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I, I rise, Mr. Speaker, to add my voice, albeit briefly, to the debate on this very important bill before us, Mr. Speaker. And that is the youth economy bill, Mr. Speaker. And I'm glad that I'm doing this today on the 26th of July, the anniversary of our first year in office. Mr. Speaker, before I make this brief intervention, if your permission, I want to take this moment again to thank the people of Soufre for Shejak for their support and for the support to the St. Lucia Labour Party. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's six o'clock, very important time, Mr. Speaker. So I will not call names, but there are hundreds of persons, what I call my soldiers, who played active role in that battle, Mr. Speaker. The battle and the Sufra were the front. They played different roles, they came with different passion, and they came with different commitments. But all played critical roles in that victory, Mr. Speaker. And when I remember that day, Mr. Speaker, I could remember different people, our young men, carrying persons to vote. But what has remained etched in my memory is the long lines at the St. Isidore Hall, Mr. Speaker, when my people from Barron's Drive decided that they would stomach the sun from morning till night, and we say we're not leaving that line until we vote. And they stayed, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. They stayed. So today, I want to say publicly again to our people of Barron's Drive, Palmis, Fobenye, New Development, Fonchin-Jacques, Chateau Belay, Itans, Bouton, Deville, Mont Lacroix, Boiden, Fongelib, my Sufra constituency group my women's brigade, uh, the cell members, and all. Those who helped, those who continued praying from before election to now. I remembered, Mr. Speaker, that I knock on every door. I went into the yellow houses and the red houses. Yeah. And the houses were open. And the, and the yellows delivered to the reds, Mr. Speaker. So today, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> today, I, yes, the, the yellows delivered to the reds. And we came together and we made a significant change and brought this seat home, Mr. Speaker. So I want to thank my boys by the river on the block. To, come to say that that victory is yours. I remain committed, Mr. Speaker, 
to continue that fight for the people of Soufre for Shejak. I want to take this moment, Mr. Speaker, as well, to thank, in a very special way, the staff at the Ministry of Commerce, especially the staff at the government warehouse, because at the moment they are under intense pressure, Mr. Speaker, for everybody looking for rice, flour, and sugar. And I, want, I know that every day they are under the microscope. So I want to thank all my permanent secretary and all my allied agencies for the support. So Mr. Speaker, back to the bill before us. As we speak, Mr. Speaker, we all know of the turmoil in this world. Spiral high prices, high inflation, threats of war, and war. We have the threats of recession, Mr. Speaker. And as we look around, the ne negative impact on us as a people. We have that. We have a coronavirus that we thought had left us and is back with us. But we have learned to live with it. Mr. Speaker, earlier on this morning, we heard the member for Viewfort North spoke about the threats of monkeypox. All of this, and as a government, we are operating within these external threats with very limited and no resources. I have reported in the past of the significant support that this government is providing, the, diff the difficult sacrifices that we are making at this time, Mr. Speaker. Our situation at home is affected by all these external shocks. And Mr. Speaker, on page 10 of the manifesto of the St. Lucia Labour Party, our political leader and our team made some bold promises to the youth of this country. And if your permission, I will read it, Mr. Speaker. That we will provide fiscal incentives to young entrepreneurs that are specifically targeted and readily accessible. To provide financing to eligible young persons to operate their business ideas in the form of grants and low interest loans. To provide marketing support for these budding entrepreneurs to market their products and services locally, regionally, and internationally. To encourage programs that support skills training, mentorship, and the development of the emotional intelligence to assist them in becoming successful young entrepreneurs. To establish a separate ministry, and today, Mr. Speaker, we are establishing it as a special agency, Mr. Speaker. I am reading this, Mr. Speaker, so that all those with heirs will hear, Mr. Speaker, that it was a promise made by our political leader and the team of the St. Lucia Labour Party. And today, it is becoming a reality, Mr. Speaker. We've made a promise to address a critical problem, and the speakers before me have mentioned it. And that problem is high unemployment among our youth. That is the challenge that we have to face. And the issue is how do we address it? As we walk around before elections now, when we engage our young people, they have a mind of their own. They stick to their own. And that is why I think this initiative in terms of having a special agency focusing on them That's right. is going to tell them that, look, we, are t we have taken you seriously. We have engaged you, we have heard you, and now we are making a special effort to address your needs in a special way, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. I've heard the comments from the member for Swazel that you have various agencies. Even the Ministry of Commerce, yes, we do. But we have sat down, we have um, strategized, and we've said, let all the young people go with the young people. We are going to address persons at 35 and above. We are going to give the support when we have to, if the hand holding. But let that agency focus 
on the young people, they will go there with people of their own, they will sit. And I think one of the things that must follow this, Mr. Speaker, is to have, as we have a, a chamber of commerce, to have a youth chamber of commerce. Let them sit and get themselves together in their own space, Mr. Speaker. Let them speak their own language and let them understand that they have a significant place and role to play in our economy. So, Mr. Speaker, they played an important role. When we made this promise, the young people came out in large numbers to vote for the St. Lucia Labour Party. And today, the St. Lucia Labour Party is saying, we heard you, we are not bluffers, we are people who deliver. And today we are delivering on this. We are delivering on this. So I want to echo um, the sentiments of the member from Miku North to urge our young people to get up. And I continue doing so in my own office, Mr. Speaker, and anywhere I meet them. We, have, we, are, placing, we are placing the environment there for you. Now it is your moment to get up That's right. and seize that opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I believe when you look at the programs that we've had, one of the issues that I know within this program that is critical, two issues, the availability of the financing and the mentoring, Mr. Speaker, and the mentoring. Because when I reflect on, on my own experience, when I sat in my father's shop and sold my coffee, that's what I made my money, that's what I paid my school from coffee, patching coffee. If I had somebody who, who could have mentored me at that time to tell me, look, put a proper label on this and a pro proper package and sell it as a St. Lucian coffee, maybe I would have been a billionaire by now. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. I think it, it is... It is, it is taking the opportunity, and when, when the young people and persons come to my office, that is what I always do. Provide the mentoring that is missing. Most times it is missing. To guide. To guide. I've taken all my efforts and I decide to share. But you could. But I'm saying that the whole issue of mentoring, guiding, and saying, look, this money you're making, there, it is not all for you to go and spend. It is, that's not the cash flow, the, the, the gross profit is not your net profit, that you have to put something aside. This is what I think is critical for us, and I believe that persons, as they come to my office, young persons like Ella Elise, whose uh, business of Note, Note by Cafe, and Mindel James, Candy Cane Beauty, and Felicia Hippolyte, here and beyond, and Johanse Casabon, Kayak Adventure, all of these young people are ready. They are ready before us, Mr. Um, Prime Minister. They are ready for the funds. So now, when they come in, we, I have to give them a startup from my own funds. Because they are, you know these young people, they are ready, when they are ready, we need to deliver. So I am pleased. I am very pleased that we are at this stage. I, I am eagerly, the young people are eagerly awaiting the passage of this bill, and not only the passage, but the full impl implementation of the program with the funding. Um, I'm excited about this, and I can, I'm looking forward in the next five, 10 years when we start having our local young millionaires. This is the signature speaker, and I support, I support this bill wholeheartedly, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member for Viewfort North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Castries East and Prime Minister for bringing this youth economy bill to the parliament. When I campaigned, Mr. Speaker, I promised the young people of Vieux for North 
new economic opportunities. Many of them, Mr. Speaker, I know, I mean, I know them very well, and many of them are well known, not only in the communities around VA for North, but in St. Lucia, for their creativity and for their prowess, whether it be in music, theater, culture, food, and so on. So when I campaigned, Mr. Speaker, I promised the young people that the St. Lucia Labor Party government would provide new opportunities for them. And I stand to support this bill also because many young people, Mr. Speaker, were part of my campaign, and many young people assisted me as parliamentary represent as the candidate to bring the seat home to the St. Lucia Labour Party. I take very brief leave, Mr. Speaker, to recognize some of them who are in the House today. And I wish, Mr. Speaker, at this time to, to really thank and pay homage to the President of the St. Lucia Labour Party Youth Organization, Mr. Shermian Propi. And, and Mr. Speaker, along with her, a number of the youth officers of our Labour Party Youth Organization who are here with us to witness the debate on this youth economy bill. They were very instrumental, Mr. Speaker, in the campaign. And I know that the young people in my constituency, and indeed all around St. Lucia, are looking forward to the enactment of this, this bill, this promise. But Mr. Speaker, before I speak a little on how I, be, how I, be, I think this bill would impact my constituency, I want to just address this issue of this issue which, which keeps coming up. The members opposite indicated that the programs are all around. Why you have programs in, in, in Belfond, you have programs in Ministry of Commerce, and why are you now creating a new youth economy agency? It's very clear to me, Mr. Speaker, that members opposite have not understood what drives economic growth and what drives economies all around the world. Mr. Speaker, there's a reason for the stock market going up and down. There's a reason for speculation. There's a reason for all of these things. And there's a big debate, as you know, Mr. Speaker, between economists and, and behavioral scientists as to what really drives economies. People like the Prime Minister and the member for Ancillary, whom I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, are on the side of the pure economists, will say to you that it's supply and demand and all of these things. People like myself, Mr. Speaker, I am more on the behavioral side. And I say to you that what really drives economies is behavior and feelings, how people feel. So, so in the next, there's a war in Ukraine, and they feel that gas prices will continue to rise. So they change their behavior. They spend less money. And that changes all the, dy the dynamics, Mr. Speaker. In Brazil, they are cutting down the forest. And the environmentalists are, are mobilizing all around, the, all around the world. If they succeed, people change their behavior. Look at what has happened to whaling. And in Japan right now, the, the whole economics around whaling has changed because of people's behavior and people's attitude. Now let's come back to St. Lucia. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, why, why do we need a separate agency for the youth economy? It's because, Mr. Speaker, young people, as we know, they're energetic, they're thinking out of the box, they don't think like us, they look at situations differently, and especially in times of crisis, COVID crisis, fuel prices increasing, Many young people are sitting at their homes in, in, in little corners on their phones and creating businesses that we don't know about. These people are creating solutions to, to the problems. And therefore, you know what? If you bring all of these people under one umbrella, the synergies begin to happen. It's almost like Silicon Valley. Why are so many of these experts from India and from all around the world, they gravitate to Silicon Valley? Why you think? Because... You, you think it's because there are mountains, there are mountains everywhere, and there are rivers and things, but they gravitate there for synergy and for the, the, the likeness of minds. Look, look, Mr. Speaker, look at Hollywood. Why do you have in the United States of America all the actors, most of them, the directors and the playwrights and so on, they gravitate to Hollywood, why? 
You think they can't stay in Miami or wherever and, and do what they do? But most of them, most of the great ones, they gravitate because of behavior, because of synergy, because the synergy of their work. They, they, they can find contact easily. So in the youth economy agency, when young people come together, it's been run by young people, managed by young people. There are synergies that are developed, Mr. Speaker. So that is why, that is why we need a separate agency for the youth economy. And Mr. Speaker, it has happened before. I remember in 1997 when the Labour Party government came to office and the, the, the member for Viva South was Prime Minister, we had people like the former Minister, Honor, former member of Parliament, Minister Rambali and Damian Greaves and them. And there was all this talk about, you had FRC, you had cultural activities all over the place. They created a new agency, the CDF, and they brought minds together. So, they, so you have synergy. And the synergy has a way of multiplying simple things into great ideas. So what will happen with this youth economy, Mr. Speaker? What, what will happen is this. Young people, even though they are not part of the management of this agency, or they are not part of it, there's a vibe that will flow in the country that there is an economic engine that belongs to us. There's a vibe. So it's not only about structure and about organization and which office doing this and which bell fund doing that. There's something about synergy and vibe in a country that, that propels economic growth. The create, if, look at what happened to Carnival. Look at what happened to Carnival. And everybody say, boy, the thing was well organized. And the shows were thing and so on. You, you know what has happened, Mr. Speaker? There's a vibe, I don't know about this one. There's a vibe which has been created. And so that is what I think the separate agency, the separate agency will do. So, Mr. Speaker, young people will gravitate to this. And not just to an office, but to an idea. To an ideal that, boy, this government has put something there for me. And just that, this government has something, the hope that is in that. This government has something for me as a young person. It doesn't matter where I come from. I can, I can get $5,000 to start a little braiding thing. And I can have a chair. And if I need plywood to, to put on my mother's house so I can start braiding. You know how many applications we have in the Viewfort North office already, Mr. Speaker? For people who are braiding, and they, they can only braid in their, in their mother's living room. And they have a lot of clients. In Bellevue, Piero, I know so many of these young people. They are braiding, they are doing wonderful work. But they are doing it in their balcony or in their mother's living room. You know what? They cannot afford immediately the sink. Or, so all they need, they, 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 their parents have given them permission. They want to put a little piece on the house. They can paint it nicely, put a sign, and have their sink and everything. One time, this becomes a business. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? They now employ somebody, maybe part-time, every weekend in the first instance. And when they grow their business, they now employ one person, and then it grows. And then slowly, in my constituency, if you have 50 of these people, then you develop 100 jobs. That is what we are going to do with the youth economy, Mr. Speaker. That is what we are going to do. Because, Mr. Speaker, Samu Kadia say, nous avons développé un programme spécial pour les jeunes qui sont ici. Et donc, nous avons une opposition qui a dit, oh, un tout programme, là, nous avons fait ça. Parce que nous n'avons pas pour faire un différent programme. Je dis, ça pas vrai, Mr. Speaker. Et si nous avons fait ça, nous avons fait ça, comme Miss Poppy, avec tout. C'est mon nom, mon pays, il y a des gens qui sont là, qui sont avec les partis, des gens qui ont une sagesse et qui ont une courage, ils ont fait différents bagailles. Et ça, nous avons dit, c'est des gens qui ont voté pour nous, avec des gens qui ont mis nous en gouvernement aussi. Avec les gens qui ont voulu jouer une opportunité à faire l'économie. Avec tout partout qui ont passé, tout partout qui ont tourné. Il y a des gens qui ont 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 des pour qui ouvrir un petit gens qui ont des 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 gens qui ont
son from Peru, Alicia Mathre, who does sushi, Mr. Speaker. You can come down for some. Jilani Moffat. Jilani Moffat, Mr. Speaker. Many times, he's the one who, who, who trims my hair. The CMOS farmers, the CMOS, pro CMOS processors, Mr. Speaker. Many people in this, in this room go to Fraser at Opico in VA for North. Fraser, rap, Fraser for wraps. And Yonli, Yonli Taylor, the driver, tourism and water related recreation activities, the tour guides at Bellevue, Opico, and Piero, Mr. Speaker. And what about young people in, in performances? We have spoken with the principal of the Piero Combined School. And very soon, Mr. Speaker, this wonderful yard at the Piero Combined School, we intend to turn it into an open air performance area. And the Minister for Tourism is very interested. He always troubles me about that, about performance areas in VA for North. But we will certainly speak to the Catholic Church and the Minister for Education to ensure that this happens. Mr. Speaker, I want to indicate at grace people like Nadia Shalry, who's a great cook, Janik Asso, Janela Shalry, who does give baskets, Ned Mitchell with his car wash, Kenya at Vevercel, <coughs> Vanessa Aldoza, and you have heard them before, the Vietwizin boys, and, and, and Zilon with, with Camp Venture. We have a wonderful camping activity in Bellevue, Mr. Speaker. You must spend an, a weekend down there. Keitha O'Brien, Antonia, and so on, the artists, and so forth. Mr. Speaker, there are so many young people who are just waiting for this opportunity. At VJ, the young people who are into cassava making, and so many of them are in, at grace, Mr. Speaker, the farmers, and in sports, we have some of the, we have the best football clubs in St. Lucia. We have only been beaten by Vuford South a few times, but we are coming for them, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, there are so many opportunities. Just over the weekend, Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to be in the constituency of Miku South. And, you know, they, they had a wonderful football competition there, Mr. Speaker. And our teams from VFO North did very well. The Young Roots Football Club from Greece won the competition. And the Veterans Football Club, the Viewfort North Veterans Football Club, Play second, the finals was between Hufort North and Hufort North. You misleading the house. <laughs> I'm misleading the house, Mrs. Bill. <laughs> A wonderful activity. So we have we have endless opportunity, Mr. Speaker. And I want to tell the young people, all those who have applied from V4 North, we, we, we have a pile as, as thick, like the Minister for Finance is not there, but we want to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that we get our fair share and that our people are ready to embrace this. And let us change the thinking. You see, it's the thinking. So because it's already in commerce, it's already there, it's already there. You know, do the same thing over and over again. But we have 30 something percent youth unemployment. But you're, we've been doing that for years and years and we still have 30 something percent youth unemployment. We have to do something different. We have to cut the chase and get the young people the help which they deserve and they need. So I support this, Mr. Speaker. And let us create synergies and let us get this aspect of our economy moving and let us see how we can improve the lot of our young people in St. Lucia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Labry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> If, if Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this evening, I am very emotional. And it is not very often that I feel in this particular way. Today, if I can recall, this is the first time I have addressed this August body on the anniversary of a victory. And I cannot help on this occasion, Mr. Speaker, 
to take my journey through the corridors of time and remember the great struggles of those who were first and foremost in fostering the birth and initial dynamics of the St. Lucia Labour Party, our party of bread justice and freedom. And if it was not for the St. Lucia Labour Party, the entire constituency of Labri Oje would be in darkness up to now. Yes, Mr. Speaker, as I look into memory's eye, I go back to Clive Compton and saw that he built our health center, the community center, and we can go way back. But at this juncture, Mr. Speaker, I want to engage in a logical digression to first go on the center line of this particular course and then digress again. At this juncture, I wish to give my full support, Mr. Speaker, to the passage of the Youth Economy Bill. The purpose of the Youth Economy Bill is to provide young people with an economic space to turn hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills to business. To establish the Youth Economy Agency for the Youth Economy Program and to facilitate the development of a Youth Economy Project and provide special incentives. Now, Mr. Speaker, a few moments ago, I said to you, if it was not for the St. Lucia Labour Party, we would have been in trouble in the People's Republic of Labour. Mr. Speaker, from 1964, to 1974. The United Workers Party dominated the political landscape of this country and did absolutely nothing for the people of Labri. In 1974, when Labri was dismembered from Beaufort and became a separate constituency, <laughs> the United Workers Party again dominated. And I would say, from 1974 until 1997, because between 1979 and 1982, it was just almost like a temporary diversion on the road from Flabo to Flabo. But even during this time, 1979 to 1982, we delivered bread, justice, and freedom to the people of this country. It was during this time that the workers of this country, Mr. Speaker, knew what it was to go to a bank and get a loan. Prior to that, they did not know anything about going to a bank and taking any loan as a traveling officer because we gave them significant increases in salaries. Daily paid workers got important increases. The National Commercial Bank of St. Lucia was formed. The St. Lucia Development Bank was formed and we move from National Provident Fund to the NIS, Mr. Speaker. In that short space of time, even when we fight, we are more effective than the United Workers' Party. <laughs> and can you imagine this period of stability and calm and cohesiveness that now exists? And so, Mr. Speaker, during the period 1974 until 1997, they dominated. And when the Star of Freedom rose in this country in 1997, more than 60% of the constituency of Labri was without basic amenities. It had to take the Labour Party and Honorable Velon Leo John to bring water to areas in Labri. I recall in 1982, when they wanted to fool the people no, it was in 1992. When they wanted to fool the people of Basla, Guaslaho, they brought electric poles and they brought so many pipes and they said they were going to bring electricity and water. The member for Kaswis North was on vacation during that time. I know you would not have supported that. And so, Mr. Speaker, during this time, we try to catch up with matters of development. And <laughs> water and electricity reached 
in all areas of that constituency. Prior to that, students had to be reading to pass the exams on the candlelight and lamps, Mr. Speaker. No water in the home. They had to go in the darkness, water, rain or shine, to go and get water to take up the house. Bobo was the order of the day, Mr. Speaker. During the period 1997 to 2006, the Labry Jetty was constructed, the Velon John Administrative Center, the Lacqua Roads, Debois and Wavinpont, the Laguas Bounce Road, and Mr. Speaker, the lands for the youth center to be erected was purchased. In 2006 and 2011, Labry's forward movement was halted from a government standpoint. But we continue to build our constituency. We build the Labry Cooperative Credit Union. We built our Labry Development Foundation. Ecolab came into existence and we continue the forward movement. We were an integral part of the early period of NYC with Augustine Dominic and Yudra Shiko as young people in this constituency. But despite the fact it was my very first term in office, Mr. Speaker, and I landed in opposition, I always believe in the principles and philosophy of this St. Lucia Labour Party. Education and healthcare were always supported by me because I believe that they are urgent priorities. It was during this time, Mr. Speaker, that I organized the Joseph Ives Simeon Youth Expose every year to pay homage to this great Viking. We had a youth expose in his honor. I established the Pascal Watson Louis Award of Academic Excellence at the Ogier Combined School and to the other schools. And today, all of them compete for that $1,000 for the student that top common entrance exam before this year and from this year the CPEA. Even when certain schools did not have graduation last year, I still gave the top student the thousand dollars. Not book voucher, but a thousand dollars. And many of the students actually came to me and say, from the time they heard about that $1,000, they wanted to compete for it. Because my whole idea when I established the Award of Excellence was to allow them to compete for it. And Mr. Speaker, over time, we have worked hard together in this constituency to bring about significant development and movement for the youth and for the people of the constituency. We came into office again in 2011 to 2016, building on the foundation that was laid by the Honorable Dr. Velon Leo John and the St. Lucia Labor Party. I was able to, of course, continue the forward movement. Monver Road, the people were suffering up there. People had to, to remove their shoes and walk. Today, that's no more. The Obuye Road, which I share with the member for Beaufort South, was built. The Bali Road, the Mission Church Road, two roads near Wilfred and the Joseph family. The Kuman Passad Road, Four Conway, Edwin the Charlie Road, Black Bay Plainfield Road, Abakapesh Road, Robinson Kodra Road. And we place lands in Proud to give residents title to those lands, Mr. Speaker. And in Labry Village, we continued along the same line of trying to catch up with matters of infrastructural development. Eucalyptus Avenue, Flamboyant Avenue, Bay Street, Plainfield Road, Lacqua Minor Road, Coolitong, Citrus Grove, Lama, Mont Paul, Olibo, Bewanger, Laho, and the establishment of the Olibo Plainfield. Mr. Speaker, I have said all of that to say to you that the St. Lucia Labour Party, if anything happens to it along the way, progress and development 
will go under in this country. And so I want to turn right now to the center line of this particular route, Mr. Speaker, which is the youth economy, to illustrate how it fits into the spectrum of development opportunities for the people of my constituency. Mr. Speaker, the youth economy was clearly reflected in this year's budget. The estimates and accentuated in the appropriation bill. Mr. Speaker, the youth economy bill is part of the Philip J. Pierre's administration to restructure the economy by providing an enabling environment to stimulate private sector investment, resulting in an increase in employment, as well as to provide for increasing resources to the youth, poor and vulnerable, for them to participate in the growth and development of themselves and the economy of this country. In addition, it's designed to put government in the digital age and to ensure that government services are more accessible to all of the people of St. Lucia from multiple service delivery platforms. This marks a departure from the approaches of the former UWP government, which provided for a distorted form of development, resulting in widening income inequality and benefiting a select few that was coined the FFF. Mr. Speaker, one of the objectives or the main objectives of a budget is to generate increased employment in the country and to provide a higher standard of living for the citizenry. On page 14 of the Prime Minister's budget address, he noted, and I quote, the youth economy aims at transforming hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills into businesses by providing committed young people with finance training, mentorship, and marketing support, unquote. It continued, Mr. Speaker, on the same page, and I quote, in activities such as sports, music, entertainment, the literary art and performing arts, modeling, designing, writing and directing, agriculture, agro-processing, blue economy, and green economy. Mr. Speaker, the youth economy is a major policy initiative that our government has taken to provide increased opportunities for employment of our youth in this new world where emphasis is placed on the digital economy and from the growth in the blue, green, and orange economies. It gives me great joy, Mr. Speaker, to see that the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance allocated in this year's budget, $10 million to facilitate the development of the youth economy. One of the major components of the youth economy is for the youth to become entrepreneurs and not rely on the traditional jobs available in the economy. It is noted that significant funds are being made available to provide the youth with the tools, knowledge, and financial support to allow them to become business men and women. And of course, for them to take their place beside others in the society to grow the economy of this country and to end this high youth unemployment. And Mr. Speaker, as I talk about youth un unemployment, youth un unemployment has remained stubbornly high despite significant policy interventions. It is clear, Mr. Speaker, that these policy interventions have failed to have the desired impact on reducing the persistently high levels of youth unemployment. Data from the 2021 Economic and Social Review shows that the youth unemployment rate over the period 2009 to 2021 has varied from a low of 41.6% to a high of 41.8% with an average over that period of 36.9%. The reference for this data, Mr. Speaker, is page 121 of the 2021 Economic and Social Review. In effect, Mr. Speaker, this effectively means that over one third of our youth are unemployed. One in three of our youth are unemployed, Mr. Speaker. 
This is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker, and we need to address this fundamental problem. Of course, the high level of unemployment will be a contributing factor to many of the other social ills, such as crime and drugs that impact our society. Mr. Speaker, this is a tremendous waste of human capital. Imagine if the unemployed youth were gainfully employed, Mr. Speaker. This would have had a tremendous positive impact on our economy and society in terms of higher levels of GDP, reduced levels of poverty and crime. It would also have a favorable impact on the mental well-being of the youth of being employed. Mr. Speaker, the performance of the economy has been a major factor accounting for the high youth unemployment rate. After recording average real economic growth over the periods 1980 to 1989 and 1990 to 1999 of 6.6% and 3.5% respectively, St. Lucia's economy has been on a trajectory of decelerated economic growth. In the decade 2010 to 2019, and Mr. Speaker, real economic growth averaged a mere 1.3%. I have deliberately not taken into consideration the 2020 period, given the significant impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy. It is clear, Mr. Speaker, that the current structure of the economy is not delivering the high levels of economic growth that are required to reduce youth unemployment. We now need to approach the matter of addressing youth unemployment differently. Mr. Speaker, as previous policy interventions have not worked, we cannot continue doing the same thing and expect a different result. The current economic model driving our economy, anchored by tourism and supported principally by the service sector, wholesale and retail, and real estate with smaller contributions by construction, manufacturing and agriculture needs to be rewired so that it can deliver on the sustainable development goals. We need to build a resilient, competitive, agile and flexible economy. There are many structural impediments in our economy, Mr. Speaker, which need to be addressed if we are to reduce the high levels of youth unemployment. St. Lucia's economy has been developed on a very narrow economic base, with the economy highly vulnerable to fluctuations in the tourism sector. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia ranks as among the least diversified economies in the region. There is a clear need, Mr. Speaker, to diversify both within the tourism sector and more broadly into other areas which offer significant growth and employment potential. We need, Mr. Speaker, to find ourselves in the digital space and to embrace the opportunities that it provides. The rise of digital technologies and the digital economy offers a unique opportunity for St. Lucia to accelerate economic growth and job creation, particularly for the youth. It will also contribute to enhancing public service delivery and building resilience. We can, Mr. Speaker, we need to create a more deeply integrated and dynamic digital economy and a digitally driven or empowered citizenry, businesses, an institution to place us on a new growth path. This will provide us with the opportunity to build a future in which seamless and efficient public services are available at the touch of a screen from even the most remote part of the island, where individuals are equipped with the technology and soft skills to find meaningful employment, particularly the youth, in a knowledge and services driven regional and global economy. And where businesses and entrepreneurs are pushing the frontiers of innovation, creating new jobs and accelerating the country's economic growth. Mr. Speaker, in this new world, we can find employment anywhere in the world by working from home. 
in order to capitalize on the opportunities offered in the digital economy, we need to, as a matter of urgency, build digital skills and creating a stronger local and regional market for them will be critical to tackling the region's unemployment challenges and maintaining competitiveness in the global economy of the future. Our education institutions are not producing enough graduates with the workforce-ready technical and soft skill sets in growing demand from digitally-enabled industries. It is also the case, Mr. Speaker, that businesses have been slow to adapt to the digital era. This has prevented those businesses from increasing their productivity and competitiveness and suppressing demand for digital talent, goods, and services in the market. Mr. Speaker, it is important for businesses to be aware of the potential benefits of digital technologies and business models. I wish to point out, Mr. Speaker, that the skills and financial resources to deploy them are also lacking, particularly among small and medium enterprise businesses. Mr. Speaker, the small and medium-sized businesses are collectively the largest employers on the island, and therefore, there is a significant potential for creating jobs in the digital sector. Currently, Mr. Speaker, very few businesses accept digital payments or use digital platforms to advertise and sell their goods and services. Fewer still are using such platforms to tap into regional and global market opportunities, adopting digital-centric business models or using data analytics to inform business strategy, integrate customer feedback, and improve efficiency. It is also the case, Mr. Speaker, that the lack of a large base of digitally active consumers reduces the perceived return on such investments. There is a need, therefore, Mr. Speaker, for there to be a simultaneous push on both the supply and demand sides to break out of this vicious cycle. We need to tackle what some have called a digital deficit and promote the development of the digital economy. Mr. Speaker, the creation of the youth economy will go a long way in providing the impetus for the transformation of our economy. Mr. Speaker, I cannot conclude this brief intervention without addressing myself to government's planned strategy of developing the green, blue, and orange economies. As we transition to a decarbonized economy by developing our renewable energy sector for solar, wind, and geothermal energy, there will be new jobs created in these sectors which will provide opportunities for our youth to be employed. It is important for us to ensure that our youth have the relevant skills and knowledge for the jobs when the renewable energy industries take off. The transition to a green economy will also reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, which account for a significant percentage of our imports and foreign exchange earnings. It is clear that renewable energy prices are competitive and even in some cases lower than the price of fossil fuels. So it is clear that we need to accelerate this transition to renewables, Mr. Speaker, which will create opportunities for the young people as established by the Prime Minister in his budget and the appropriation bill. This will not only help us in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, but also provide us with greater energy security and lower energy cost which will be beneficial to both consumers and businesses. Similarly, Mr. Speaker, we need to focus on optimizing all of the resources to ensure that we can maximize economic growth that is sustainable and does not deplete our natural capital. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, we need to ensure that we maximize the value that we can obtain from our ocean resources and in this regard, pursue the implementation of a blue economy strategy. 
In the last sitting of Parliament, we passed a loan resolution for unleashing of the blue economy for the Caribbean project. Our marine resources are significantly greater than our land resources, and it is therefore important, Mr. Speaker, that we optimize the sustainable use of these resources so that we can create significant jobs from our ocean resources for the young people of this country. The unleashing of the blue economy for Caribbean project is designed to foster economic recovery and support marine and coastal resilience in the countries participating in this project. Importantly, Mr. Speaker, the project will strengthen the competitiveness and sustainability of two critical interconnected sectors, namely fisheries and tourism, and one underlying enabling infrastructure service, waste management, Mr. Speaker. This project will aim to boost economic recovery by strengthening regional and national policies and institutional frameworks to bring back businesses and attract new investments which will create new jobs in the economy for the young people of this country. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the project will scale up innovative financing mechanisms aimed at enhancing employment and productivity in the tourism, fisheries, and waste management value chains through establishment of a regional MSME matching grant program and a regional climate risk fisheries insurance scheme. One can clearly see the nexus between the development of the youth economy and the blue economy, Mr. Speaker. Another area that the youth economy is targeted at is the growth of the creative industry sector as accentuated by the member for Vipanov and more broadly the orange economy. The creative industry sector is a growing segment of our economy which has provided significant benefits to our youth. We need to build on that platform that has already been laid and provide greater support to the artists in the creative industries, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Implementation arrangements are critical to ensuring that we can successfully deliver on the desirable outcomes for the youth economy. I am pleased to note that agency charged with the responsibility of driving the youth economy will be a statutory authority and therefore will have greater flexibility in how it operates. This statutory authority has, based on the bill, four main areas of focus. These are one, training, two, marketing, three, finance, loans and grants, and mentorship. I sincerely believe that the development of the youth economy is, as the Prime Minister stated, as the Prime Minister stated in his budget address, the first step in transforming the St. Lucia economy, driven by technology innovation, and entrepreneurship where young people, regardless of their socioeconomic status, can become active participants in wealth creation and nation building." Unquote. Mr. Speaker, I cannot co conclude this extremely brief intervention without alluding to the challenge of managing the transition from the last administration to the current. Managing, managing transitions from one administration to another is never easy. And in this particular case, it was a nightmare given the legacy bequeathed to us by the former government, in which the country was on the verge of be, being a failed state and in high risk of debt default. The government of the St. Lucia Labour Party, however, has had an excellent driver at the steering wheel an excellent economist who has been managing this economic crisis with aplomb. Mr. Speaker, I refer to no other than the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Development and Youth Economy, the member for Castries East, the Honorable Philip Joseph Pierre, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I close, we are by no means out of the hoods as the fiscal situation that we inherited was extremely gloomy, but our Minister for Finance has stabilized the situation, and the recently passed budget has laid the foundation for the recovery in the short term and provide the springboard for sustained economic growth and development. 
As a result, St. Lucia will achieve the level of macroeconomic stability as well as the fiscal space needed to create opportunities for real increases in expenditure on social services, reduce the cost and risk for all investors, and therefore lay the foundation for increased investment and growth. Mr. Speaker, so today I join the patriotic members of this Honorable House in commending the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance in presenting for members' consideration the Youth Economy Bill, which intends to return people to the center of public policy and expand opportunities for the youth of our country. Long live Honorable Philip Joseph Pierre. Long live the St. Lucia Labour Party. And long live St. Lucians, Mr. Speaker. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Member for Ancillary Canaries, let us assume that whilst you were in this mode of preparation, someone else had put on the microphone. What was I to have done? You have, in, you have given instructions to the police officer that you're speaking next. <laughs> the speaker was not aware of that. So all of the preparation that was taking place there, had somebody else put on the microphone, what then? So, but please proceed, member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, permit me for a brief moment to pay tribute to the mover of this bill for his 25 years of service to constituency and country. During the last year, Mr. Speaker, he has tackled the economic and social challenges confronting our country with a calmness, a thoroughness, and a professional analytic vigor which these times demand. Working with him as his junior minister in the Ministry of Finance to contain our inherited debt burdens, to shield our people from imported and rising inflationary prices, to ride the turbulent and economic waters that destiny has called upon him to come, has been for me a lesson in the art of quiet but effective leadership. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for cash resist. The constituency of Ansari Canaries thanks you, Honorable Philip Joseph Pierre, Member of Parliament for cash resist. Members, I have been very liberal in this, in allowing members to refer to others by name. The rules specifically do not allow for it. But I've been liberal, but you cannot directly, when a member's name is called in this house, he's about to be brought before the Committee of Privileges or to be removed from the chamber. We are constituencies in here, not individual members. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Cashfries East, Prime Minister of our beloved country, for his example, for his guidance, for his counseling, and I pledge, Mr. Speaker, my unwavering support as he continues his new chapter in his political history. Mr. Speaker, as I stand before this honorable house with the privilege to debate and represent, I wish to thank the people of Ansari Canaries for the honor to stand here today. I would also like to thank my family, my constituency groups, the hardworking men and women in the constituency, and clearly, Mr. Speaker, given my navel string is buried in the constituency, they responded to the question of my pedigree. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, creating a defined space for the youth 
as economic actors is fundamental for our sustainable development. Young people, given the chance, have a proven capability to lead change that is a vital and valuable investment for now and the future. Having targeted policies, Mr. Speaker, to promote youth as an asset is a priority of this government. See our manifesto, Mr. Speaker. Commitment made, commitment kept. Mr. Speaker, our plan to invest and empower our youth to realize their potential for training, mentorship, business advisory support, and the provision of financing is at the core of our transportation strategy. We want to encourage and provide opportunities for youth empowerment where young people can be exposed to the economic opportunities that will lead to a reduction in poverty and enable them to make meaningful contributions to society. Because, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that all they need is a chance, a chance at a better life, a chance at better and other opportunities, a chance at being first and not last. The young entrepreneurs within the constituency that required a location to ply their trade, provide a service, were denied that opportunity with the demolition of functional structures under the previous administration. Wow. And some statistics for the member for Sozel to educate him as to why we insist that there is room for a youth economy. He mentioned that there were existing programs already in place to assist the young people of this country. So we'll just go for them very briefly, Mr. Speaker. He referred to Boost, Mr. Speaker. He may be aware that out of the almost 100 applications, there's only two who qualified from Ancillary, five from Viewfort, three from Soufre, and 19 from Castries. He also mentioned the Small Business Development Center. Of the 2,083 applicants between 2017 and 2021, Castries, 45%. Grosely, 23%. Viewfort, 9%. Denry, 5%. Soufre, 4%. Sozel, 3%. Ancillary, 2%. Labry, 2%. Canneries, 1%. So that gives you an understanding, Mr. Speaker, of why we think it's important to reach those who are not being dealt with at this point in time. The young people of this country, Mr. Speaker, have nothing to fear of the future, as nothing is as powerful as an ignited mind. This bill, Mr. Speaker, seeks to elevate and not denigrate our young people. And we all would remember the comments coming out of the last government regarding what they felt about young people. You will recall in particular, Mr. Speaker, the words of the former member of parliament for Castries East, when he was essentially saying, that young people are only interested in handouts. I think we will very... Cash Free South East, my, my apologies. Cash Free South East. That young people were essentially interested in handouts. We will demonstrate, Mr. Speaker, in the not too distant future, that the young people of this country are committed, dedicated, hardworking, and given the opportunity, will succeed. Mr. Speaker. We are going to hear very shortly from the opposition, I would imagine, that why haven't we done more? The question is, what have we inherited to allow us to do more? We've borrowed between March, and they have borrowed between March 2020 and July 2021, a total of $823 million. $823 million. What has happened to it, I can't say to you as yet, Mr. Speaker, but there's a bill being discussed later this evening which will begin to unravel some of the answers for us. Mr. Speaker, we believe in the young people of this country. We are here to support them. I therefore give my full support to this bill, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much.
the member for Miko South. Member for Miku South, I think there is an issue with the length of the cord. So you're going, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today on this particular bill, Mr. Speaker, because anything to do with the youth or young people of our country, in essence, we're dealing with the future of our country. And I will always take any contribution to deal with young people very seriously, Mr. Speaker. And I know it would be very easy to fall into the trap I've seen with other politicians of getting up and just to criticize, maybe for criticize's sake, or find loopholes that may try to embarrass the other side or to try to undermine. But I believe that there are some topics in this House, Mr. Speaker, that deserve much more than that. When we're dealing with crime, as we've all said, all of us, repeatedly, crime is not any one particular person's problem, it's all of our problems. Because even if we are affected directly by crime, and unfortunately some people have been, we're all indirectly affected by the impact of what crime does to our economy and to the psyche of our nation. Young people are very important, Mr. Speaker. And the speakers before me have alluded to the fact that in the last 20 years, youth unemployment has been high. And many of us understand that those young persons who stayed on the block, who may have chosen a different path, or may not have gone down a bad road, but as you have so eloquently pointed out and accurately weren't given an opportunity. And as they say, a mind is a horrible thing to waste. We've all seen better in our lives. We've seen that greatness can come from anywhere. There are persons who come from the most diminished and demeaning backgrounds which have found success. But unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, those tend to be more the exception than they are the generality. I am one for sure, Mr. Speaker, that believes that how we categorize things in life is important. Names matter. Titles matter. And the impression, the expectation that they give. So I want to say that I think that this youth economy bill is extremely well-meaning. I believe that giving somebody with very little opportunity the hope that they can start something. And as the Prime Minister indicated, even if they fail, we would have encouraged them to apply themselves 
and to believe for the first time that there was an opportunity for them. That's well-meaning. But the reality, Mr. Speaker, is I think the title of what we've chosen, which is the Youth Economy Bill, is overambitious. And particularly when you look at the details of what is being attempted to do, it is huge. And yet the resources extremely limited. And like my colleague from Choiseul indicated, Mr. Speaker, there has to be some synergy. There has to be some tie-in where we are maximizing the resources we've already spent all throughout our economy, both in the private sector, in the public sector, as well as through international organizations who are all providing help of some sort to young people. And if, in fact, that this was going to be a coordinating agency, Mr. Speaker, I think it would be very, very successful. I think an entity of individuals focused only on young people, on the broader aspect of young people, helping to develop policy, helping to rationalize the agencies we have, Mr. Speaker, would have been very well placed. But I see a mixture between an attempt to do that, Mr. Speaker, and really what seems to be the cry of the day. We're talking about something that's not new. This is a microbank. This is an opportunity to provide either in the form of grant or very, very concessionary loans, small loans to individual people. I mean, India has mastered that art, not only with young people, but in particularly with housewives, people who are otherwise unemployable, in helping them establish their own small businesses. Mr. Speaker, I say that because the key ingredient to help our young people succeed, and maybe in looking back in terms of what are some of our shortcomings as a country, is opportunity. And are we creating an environment of competitiveness? We're creating an environment in which we are producing young people who are globally competitive. I'm very proud of the fact that in our mission statement as a political party, we've spoken about creating a globally competitive education system. Because we also believe very sincerely that in order for a young person to fulfill all of their obligations or goals, may not be just possible in St. Lucia. But for some, that's sufficient. But for persons who may come up with a, a genius idea of creating a product, we should create an opportunity where those products are exposed on an international basis. And I think the Prime Minister, sorry, the member from Castries East, I apologize, Mr. Speaker, said that the goal is that when tourists come here is to extract as much money from them as possible. I agree with that. But it means that we have to provide them with products that are world class, products that are unique, and products that are ours, indigenous to St. Lucia, are special. To say to somebody that they can just replicate something that already exists. So if we take as an example, Mr. Speaker, we go to the Castries market. T-shirts. More than 90% of the T-shirts are imported. But worst part is the intellectual property right on those T-shirts is imported. Yemen. Where is our Nobel laureates? Where is our parrots? Where is our pitons? Where are our unique and special plants in our iguanas? Where is the creative juices of our young people and our creative industry in coming up with designs that are unique, that are uniquely ours? Mr. Speaker, the example I always make reference to about things not happening by accident is the athletic program in Jamaica. I mean, just recently we got to see the World Championship Games. I'll pass no comment on what happened there. But we saw the success of Jamaica. The Jamaican women won 
first, second, third, if I'm not mistaken, in the hundred. First, second, third, in the two hundred. And we saw many Jamaican athletes, track athletes, perform at the highest levels. And that is something that we've become accustomed to. And the reality is that in a large part, the success of that program is the competition that is taking place at the preschool and the high school levels. And I've always said that the most amazing part about Usain Bolt's success on a global scale, becoming one of the greatest track athletes that we've ever had, wasn't Usain himself. It was the fact that his coach was a high school coach. That his coach stayed with him and took him to that level. That tells you the quality of coaching that's taking place at that level. And it's an amazing thing. And the reality is the games that they have and that level of competition at the junior high school and high school level drives that level of, com of competition. And that competition drives excellence and creates within young people all the values that you require to be successful in life. And so many successful business persons have found early successes, whether it's in the sports or in, in the arts or some level of competition. And it is what they developed as young people to succeed that carries through with them to everything else. So the reality is, is that our job, really as a country, Mr. Speaker, is to create an opportunity for where we believe that people have the greatest opportunity to succeed. I, for many years, have continued to hear people speak about how fickle tourism is. Yet, after 9-11, fastest recovering industry in the world was tourism. After the recession, the fastest recovering industry in the world is tourism. We've now seen with COVID, and the reality is that tourism is becoming the largest, has become the largest industry in the world. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, is that for many people around the world and a growing number of those persons, travel is no longer an option. It's not a luxury. It's become a way of, of lifestyle. And the reality is that people are growing old of simply going somewhere just on a beach vacation. And it requires us to be able to expand our product. So I want to say that United Workers Party, cognizant of what I've been saying, understood that you can do some things that might solve the problem in part. So I'm proud of the fact that when we came into office in 2016, youth unemployment was 44%. By the end of 2019, that number was down to 31%. We're moving in the right direction. And so some immediate interventions, and the examples are the NAP program, where we saw that there was an opportunity to get young people employed in the cruise industry, an opportunity for them to get training at a, a world-class level and to be paid a salary to do so, so they wouldn't have to go into debt. In, in a, a tech VOC industry in which skill sets are so important, the NAP program in terms of what we did in terms of getting Ojo Lab here and I tell, I, uh, I tell BPO and also working with KM Squared to say, are there opportunities that we can facilitate immediate employment? Because we knew that those sectors were going to favor younger persons. It doesn't resolve the problem for every single young person. But as I said, it was an immediate and measure that bore immediate results. In the meanwhile, what we understood is that we have to change our education system. We have to create a new curriculum that's suited towards what we think younger people are going to do. Creative industries, intellectual property rights, trademarking, understanding, and even before COVID, where it exploded, the opportunity to work for international companies and being based in St. Lucia. So an, a back of the office operation, a BPO operation, really is where a company does that. But now there are opportunities for individual persons to be able to do the same thing. To stay here in St. Lucia and work for Apple. To work for Google. 
to work for Fortune 500 companies. And the significant benefit is, is that they get to be with their family. And the income that they're earning, which is no longer on a domestic basis, but on an international basis, creates a huge opportunity. Mr. Speaker, young people working at a young age, either through apprenticeship programs or taking out original jobs. So for instance, we may say, boy, going to work at a hotel, that's not a lifestyle. But guess what? When you're working there, you're earning a salary, but you're learning about the industry. You're meeting foreigners. You're starting to think, see how they think. And I always use the example of a, a Jamaican who moved to Cayman Islands and his wife got a job, but he couldn't get a job. Very difficult in Cayman. And he remembered the recipe that his mother had for rum cake. And so he decided to make a rum cake. And the, the name of the rum cake was called Tortuga Rum Cake. And it was kind of original in that he put this octagonal box together. And he started selling that rum cake to one hotel. And eventually he started doing well and he started selling it to multiple hotels in Cayman. And then what happened is that long before the internet came, we used to have mail orders. And so the business people that were coming down would put in regular orders to him to provide the Tortuga rum cake as gifts to their friends and to their business associates. And eventually, his business grew into um, the duty-free shops. And he started pairing in Puerto Rico and in the other parts of the Caribbean. And now they are actually providing branded products on a global basis through the distribution of duty-freeze. As far as Hong Kong, remember I was passing through Hong Kong and I saw Tortuga rum cake there, I was amazed. Now, when he started, he was very dependent on that one hotel. And he grew to be dependent on tourism in Cayman, and then he grew to depend on tourism in the Caribbean, and now he's grown into an international business. And that's what I've always said. One thing I know about almost 99% of every single big business in the world is started small. And it's the fundamentals that you learn in a small business and applying new technologies, etc., that allow you to grow into a much bigger business. So when we think of our linkage to tourism in St. Lucia, it is naive to think of it as only the number of tourists that come to St. Lucia. In fact, there's a huge opportunity now with the internet that if we're successful at using the 1.2 million tourists that are coming to St. Lucia and exposing them to the different brands of cocoa, the different brands of coffee, the different brands of rum that we have, that they become exposed. In fact, Barcardi used that model very successfully in Puerto Rico. In fact, created a tour um, that they actually subsidized and it really helped their marketing program. So Mr. Speaker, putting these infrastructure into place is very important if we're going to deal with the young people of this country. And creating an environment in which they can get proper training, understand all of the opportunities for them to be able to succeed is important. It's not going to happen by itself. Which one did you create? It is not going to happen by itself. Which one did you create? So Mr. Speaker, the United Workers Party created the NAP program, the Groselay Academy, Village Tourism, t -Village. So imagine the model that was created in Groselay. What was that created for, Mr. Speaker? What was TV Lodge created for? It was created to create an opportunity for small business people to be given an environment in which they can succeed. How many small business people I saw having to squat on the side of a road, find a piece of, of, of a, a, a walkway to open up a small business? And I can say to you, the businesses that moved into the Grosley T Village, it was empowering. <laughs> and for the first time, they actually now had a piece of real estate that whether they were leasing it or at least to purchase, now had equity to be able to go to the banks with and to show that they had stability. 
in the development of the West Coast Road, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing a massive opportunity for multiple tea villages. When you pass by Roseau and you see vendors on the side of the road, Mr. Speaker, without facilities. So I'm saying to you, Mr. Speaker, all of those things were being put in place. And examples and models were being set around this country to create that environment. Now what I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, is we're not going to solve the youth problem with one bill. We're not going to solve the youth problem by calling it the youth economy in some magically way that that's going to wave a wand to solve this problem. The reality is a small island developing state with a limited population of 180,000 with very high cost of operations. We're going to have to be creative on how we're going to do that. And so business entrepreneurship becomes a very critical component to what we're talking about. So Mr. Speaker, when you review some of the things that we did and spoke about in our manifesto. So today I heard about agro-processing as if there was something magical or unique about providing incentives. That's been done for years. So we said, provide training to add value to our cultural products. So the Prime Minister made reference to bananas. He, he forgets the reason why people were laughing was because he was suggesting that people eat more bananas. But now I see that that has now transformed over time into actually using bananas as a byproduct to produce banana paper, to do banana flour, to do all kinds of different things with banana, which we've always supported. In fact, when you go into Invest St. Lucia, you will see that the branding of Brand St. Lucia was linked to our culture, was linked to um, the call centers, was linked to every single product that we were producing to take advantage of the synergy of a singular brand. To encourage young farmers to venture into the production of honey and its byproducts, provide concessions for the purchase of machinery and equipment. In the area of tourism, provide training and tourism, provide access to funding $10 million from the CARICOM Development Fund for the uh, on lending to the small businesses in the sector. And again, village tourism, you know, whatever name you want to call it, the minister wants to call it uh, community tourism right now, that's his prerogative, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is village, village tourism was about creating an enabling environment in our villages to give small businesses, and in particular, our young people an opportunity to succeed. They are significantly dis disadvantaged when they're having to vend on the ground, when the stalls that they have look visible. And the reality is we must invest in creating a new environment of excellence. And going to work where you can see those facilities in place makes a big difference. Make available strategic lands to locals, including beachfront property for investment. What we were going to do in Sandy Beach was about subdividing and putting facil facilities across from Sandy Beach. Okay, no sir. Not the one I gave the DSH. But you see, Mr. Speaker, this is what I'm talking about when we speak about the politics of old. So the reality is, is that in order to, to demean or to take away from the value of what is being said, the message is getting lost. But it's okay, Mr. Speaker. The people of St. Lucia have spoken. We've learned our lesson. We're going to be much more articulate in terms of describing. So the reality is, is that we were subdividing over 80 acres of land to create opportunities for St. Lucians to be able to purchase land and to get incentives and to create an environment for them so that it was properly designed and it would be world class. And again, it would be across the street from Sandy Beach so that the concrete road would have become a massive broadwalk. Provide skills training, provide more avenues for the local sale and export of their products. Establish a national platform, a platform, establish a national performing arts center. Establish creative hubs that will house multiple orange economy business clusters. We spoke about that, Mr. Speaker, of creating an opportunity where young people who are lawyers, young people who are um, software designers, young people who are into marketing, where they're working in clusters and learn the idea that 
this, the sweat equity is their knowledge. And all of a sudden, if you put together a plan, Mr. Speaker, in which you have your legal part already done because that becomes the contribution of the, of the lawyer there, the design of the software is being done, the marketing is being done, that is sweat equity. So when you go to the bank to be able to bark, whether it's to the micro bank or whether it's to the development bank of St. Lucia or whether it's to a normal commercial bank, is to get them to understand the value of that sweat equity. And that each one now gets to participate in the company and gets shares, that's the form of equity. And if that project is successful, Mr. Speaker, everyone benefits. But the reality is, and that's not something that we are going to change overnight. The reality is, is that it takes many small businesses to fail before one succeeds. Many. Okay? In fact, many people liken it to a turtle laying eggs. How many eggs does a turtle lay in order for a couple of turtles to survive? And that has been the generality. And that's why the Foreclosure Act and so many of the things that we're currently working on are so important to give people that second chance to understand that small businesses, and we, let's not confuse, because when we talk about a little vending stall or small business, that clearly is a micro business. But the reality is I'm speaking about businesses that start small, that have the opportunity to take advantage of the global market and to become a larger business. And the unique thing is, is that that business's headquarters will always be in St. Lucia. And so when we talk about creating that, eco, uh, that intellectual property power, it's about creating that enabling environment, Mr. Speaker. Provide training through the Cultural Development Foundation in core areas to include technology and intellectual property. Mr. Speaker, we didn't just select Carnival to become the largest event in St. Lucia over jazz, just because we wanted to be different. We chose Carnival because Carnival is ours. There are greater examples of St. Lucians even before we put the stuff in place, even before we put everything in place, Mr. Speaker, of St. Lucians that were number one on the charts in songs overseas. And the reality is that that's what we wanted to do, was to empower our young people. So instead of spending $14 million on a jazz festival, Mr. Speaker, I regret we didn't spend more on Carnival, but we were growing Carnival. And Carnival now creates costume designs, creates our own music, creates our own single brand. So even like when we talk about Denry Segment, Denry Segment is a unique type of music that's ours. And that we need to support that platform in order to be able to help it promote it on an overseas basis. Facilitate virtual platforms for the use by local artists, recognizing as a major avenue for international sales. We need to be able to create an app that anybody who's visited St. Lucia can go and see the marketplace of the things they may not have seen. Whether it's our music, whether it's our rum, whether it's our coffee, whether it's our cocoa, whether it's our paintings. Establish a digital academy at Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Again, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's not sufficient to say that the young people by themselves are going to go on the internet and educate themselves. There still has to be institutions in our country, Mr. Speaker, that helps our young people become better and awakens them to the competition that's out there and how good they're going to have to come to the table. So again, providing that kind of education at Sir Arthur Lewis College helps a lot of younger people who may not be able to travel abroad. Prioritize skills development and micro um, and graphic design programming, big data analytics, mobile app development, social media marketing, robotics, artificial intelligence. We introduced robotics into the schools, Mr. Speaker, at a very young age. <coughs> It's not about waiting for somebody to graduate to then figure out what is it they like. Some people, at a very young age, start to figure it out. But in order to do that, we must expose them. So Mr. Speaker, a big part of instituting that, and why we were building the sporting facilities around the country, and I've said it, is to take from the example of the aquatic center. So here it is, a 25-meter pool. 
and small by comparisons on an international basis. But look at what it's produced. And the reality is the success of the aquatic center, seven um, uh, teams, or seven, um, what do they call them? Mr. Speaker, clubs. Now, what makes those clubs work, Mr. Speaker, are the parents. When you go to the aquatic center, the parents are heavily engaged, whether it's in becoming coaches, whether it's becoming and helping organize the events, and it's the competition. Seven clubs competing on a regular basis. And then when you invite two international or three international clubs to come by, you now have at least eight or nine teams that are participating. And it's that constant competition that creates that level of excellence. So what we wanted to do was to be able to zone St. Lucia out and create cl uh, clusters of clubs in those zones. And our clubs have to mature and go to a different level, Mr. Speaker. Our clubs cannot be just about one discipline at a senior level or a junior level. It has to be, Mr. Speaker, I believe, multiple disciplines, and I think that the member from Castries East was moving in that direction. The reality is we want sports that are going to be, give young people an opportunity to get a scholarship. So what are the sports that are women and men? What are the sports that provide the greatest number of scholarships? And very importantly, that a member from Castries he spoke about, what are the sports that are going to create professional opportunities? In my opinion, when you look at those three criteria, soccer, football, is the number one sport. Now the fact is, if you're going to do soccer, which is what we chose, you're also going to do track and field, because again, provides opportunities for men and women, provides multiple scholarships at Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, and also has professional leagues around the world. Basketball, tennis, swimming, all those provide huge opportunities, but the reality, as a small state of 180,000 people, we're not going to be able to promote excellence at every discipline. And again, understanding how the pieces fall into play, the Grosley Academy, which was an academy for the North, and the eventuality was to build an academy in the South, was what? Taking students who, at a very young age, are showing opportunity. <clears throat> to create an opportunity for them where they, they can continue their education, but in an environment that supports the development of their skills. And the coaches that are going to be there are the coaches who are now going to train all of the coaches in your communities. So Mr. Speaker, I, I say these things because I don't want anyone to be under the impression this is not to tout United Workers Party, but this one bill is miraculously going to solve the problem. Now, if, if I were to genuinely believe that members on the opposite side, Mr. Speaker, actually felt the pain, not just say it, not just display it, but actually felt it, why is it taken one year? One year to bring this simple piece of, of legislation to the table? What is, what is it that you're doing in all the meanwhile, Mr. Speaker? I don't understand. We said we want to create a national youth and sports authority. Again, we have a situation, Mr. Speaker, that's been coexisting or been happening for a long time. We have this situation, um, I don't know if the member from Viewfort South remembers, the lottery, in which monies from our lottery go into the lottery association. And we've been using the lottery monies primarily to support our sports programs. But the administration of the lottery has never been amended to put skill sets to accommodate that. So what we were proposing to do was to move the lottery into the gaming authority, which again was also understaffed, and create a synergy. And, and organize that the vast majority of the money that was earned in the lottery would now go to a youth and sports association. 
Why? Dedicated people focused on the development of youth and sports. And then when we're executing plans, we have people who understand the industry and are creating a template for the development of youth and sports in our country. So here it is, we're going to, I can't remember, and the member from Cass Suisse can remind me, I can't remember whether we are borrowing this money from the Taiwanese or is this a grant, the $10 million is a grant from the Taiwanese. But $5,000 loans, $5 million, is going to be 1,000 loans. Now, I went and looked at the numbers for the Solution Development Bank. Solution Development Bank had 27 people employed. And the cost of operations, staffing and operations is $3 million a year. And they were processing 100 loans a year through their development thing. And they were able to increase that to 1,000 loans when we now started processing the um, uh, training for the, the, cruise ship path, the cruise ship trainers that were going through them. So in essence, they lent them the money and the cruise ship was paying back the loan directly. No, sir. So what we did is was to try to develop the synergies for the bank in order that the bank created better economies of scale and it was in a, a better place to be sustainable. Because there's no point in creating these institutions, Mr. Speaker, if they're not going to be financially viable, if they're always going to be struggling and looking for money. So I, I want to say I applaud the initiative, but I'm hoping at a later date, we actually are going to see the entire plan as to where we're going to go with the youth economy. And I certainly would not want young people to believe that this is the panacea that's going to solve all the problems. Establish a framework to reactivate and strengthen the district youth and sports councils, expand leadership training programs, establish youth centers within existing community facilities, facilitate greater participation of clubs in the after school programs. And we really felt very strongly as a government that the sporting activities and the training of arts should be done after school. Because some children actually commute to further dis longer distances. And so by coming back to your community makes them much more accessible. And there is that affinity to the club that we have. Organize youth engagement in sports and arts through establishment of new community clubs. So again, is to help support the development of these clubs and to make sure that they are providing multiple sporting disciplines as well as the development of the arts. So it, 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 why should a, a very good football player be deprived of being acting or taking dance classes? So apprenticeship programs include the ICC sector. Make further financing available through the Youth Enterprise and Equity Fund at the St. Lucia Development Bank. Expand the current regime of concessions available to artists in their individual capacity as a business enterprise. The UW government is in its focus to encourage young entrepreneurs will continue to provide access to funding through several arrangements that include grants, loans, and concessionary terms from SLEB and other agencies. We also amended the Fiscal Incentives Act number 30 of 2019 to provide the fiscal incentives. Enterprise across all service sectors to all our, of our economy will benefit from this regime of funding and fiscal incentives. So Mr. Speaker, the development of our young people is also important that we develop a sustainable economy. We gotta grow our economy. The member from Labrie, again with his statistics, showed that in the early 80s up until the mid 90s, we were growing an average of 6%. And unfortunately in the last 20 years, according to his calculation, we've only been averaging uh, one and a half percent. The GDP of this country is too small. So I would say to you, Mr. Speaker, and I would certainly like to express to my colleagues on the other side, let's be careful when we want to demonize tourism 
and say, oh, we're over dependent on tourism. The reality is, is that we still have a lot of opportunity to grow. I do support the concept, Mr. Speaker, that we should not just be doing tourism. But it's not to say we're going to stop doing tourism and we're now going to start emphasizing something else. The measurement that we were using was output per acre. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, the one resource that we have that we cannot create any more of is land. Land is very valuable. It's not to say that people are not valuable. People are very valuable. But the reality is if we reach full employment in this country, you can bring more solutions here. You can bring more people from the OECS here. You can bring more people from CARICOM to St. Lucia. If in fact you can create that number of jobs. And just to put it in perspective, and I know that some people get offended by when we say this, but Singapore is exactly the same physical size as St. Lucia. And there are six million people who live in Singapore. Four million on a permanent basis and two that commute on a daily basis. Singapore's GDP is $365 billion. Ours is 2.2. And if you compare it closer to home, Aruba is producing almost $45 million of output per acre. St. Lucia is nine. Barbados is 35. The Bahamas is $150 million output. So the potential is here. And we are marred down in petty politics. And I have no difficulty in having any conversation about any policy and then we can, we can disagree. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the focus has to be about growing our economy and able to be able to afford the service. So when I hear a person say, oh, we're going to do an investigation because $800 million was borrowed? Really? If that's the criteria, then we should be going back a couple of more years and see how much money was borrowed. That's a nonsensical statement. That's misleading. And that's deliberately attempting to do that. How much was borrowed? The reality is, excuse me? How much was borrowed? But it's in the book. It's, I don't have to tell you. Well, you can go and look in the social economic review. Go and go into look at the social economic review. The question is, what was it? The question. Oh, you're now the speaker. Again, you're now the speaker. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, I believe that in pursuing our greatness as a country is tied into creating the opportunities for our young people to be great. And not all of them are going to be the business person. So I heard the member from Caswee's EU's modeling as an example. The reality is if there's an opportunity for modeling, a modeling agency would have opened up here and a solution would have done it. And that's what we want to be able to do is to develop entrepreneurs that are going to create now these portals of, of opportunity and success. And it's to teach those, those skills at a, a school level of creative thinking. So we keep saying it, oh, our, our education system is flawed, it's not succeeding, and yes, we're doing well academically, but we're not becoming entrepreneurs. And so if we're going to become an entrepreneur hub, Mr. Speaker, there's a lot more that we're going to have to do than having a youth economy that really is a micro bank in name. And I support it. I think it's going to play a very meaningful role. I don't want to demean it in any way, but I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, if a government is coming to the table one year afterwards, and this is their flagship piece of legislation for the first year, then I really feel sorry for all of us because I think we're going to be let down. And I know that you guys are better than that. I know that you can do better. And I want to see, I want to see this government succeed. I want to see you do better in what we were doing in sports. I want to see you do better in what we were doing in building the, the roads. I want to see you do better in fixing up the schools. I want to see you do better in creating business opportunities for this country. I don't need, and I don't think the rest of St. Lucia needs to hear you come here and lament about what you think our feelings were. Do better for this country. That's the greatest gift you can give. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member of Castries South.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to lend support to the bill as presented by the member for Castries East. Mr. Speaker, today is a very special day. And it is special not just because it celebrates one year since we won the general elections. It is also special because I have spent many years in defense of the young people of St. Lucia. I am an offspring of the youth and student movement in St. Lucia. And I recall as far back as 1985, when as part of the National Youth Council, we were displeased with the developmental trajectory in St. Lucia. And we prepared a draft white paper on youth development for St. Lucia. And maybe the member from Castries North would remember some of those exchanges. He was part of the youth movement then. And although we had different shades, we always had that deep commitment to improving the conditions of young people in St. Lucia. And he will tell you, we would tease him often, that he really did not belong where he was because we always fought his heart. And together with this is Louis George, very close you know, friend I know of the former prime minister, member from Beaufort South, persons who showed a deep sensitivity to some of the issues that we were fighting for. And 1985 was International Year of the Youth. And as far back then, we were thinking and dreaming of how we can change our paradigm to put young people at the center of national development. And despite the works that were done before 1997, in 1997, we got an opportunity under the leadership of the member for Viewford South to really bring into practice a lot of the ideas that the youth movement had. And he provided the fertile soil for us to do so much, Mr. Speaker. And we're seeing today what is a qualitative improvement on some of the ideas that were propagated as far back as 1997. And the member from Viewer South will tell you, and maybe you can remember, Mr. Speaker, because in an earlier life, you shared you know, space with us in a lot of those discussions. And I can always remember the member from Jeffort South when he said we were going to start the short-term employment program. And he said, as part, it was a $10 million loan from the First Caribbean Bank. I'm not sure if he can remember those things. He's not as active as he used to be before. So, so, so maybe he can remember. But he said we needed to look at the OES Youth Skills Training Program which was promoted heavily by the member for Castries North. And he said to us that this was not good enough for the young people of St. Lucia. We need to improve it. And he said, form a national skills development program. Improve it. And in those days, we started to speak about computer-aided learning. And he said to move it from what it was and introduce the use of computers to train our young people. 1997. And then he told us, don't stop there. Because when we train them, they need to get somewhere to get the financing so they can become part of the economy. Training is not enough. And he said, form the James Belgrave small business called what is called now Belfan. I had never known of James Belgrave until that lecture. That's 1997 under the St. Lucia Labour Party. And we come in full circle 25 years later under the leadership of Philip J. Pierre to institute what we call a youth economy. And I've heard a lot from the members opposite about what a youth economy is. I don't pretend to be an economist. A lot of people pretend to be an economist. I have a brother who's an economist, he, econometrics, he specializes in econometrics. And I keep telling him I'm a better economist than him. 
years in economy and teaching. I keep telling him that. I don't pretend. I studied economics at university too, but I don't pretend. But I think we need to reflect on what we refer to when we speak of a youth economy. And I want to share a few thoughts on it. But before that, Mr. Speaker, you will forgive me if I respond to some of what we just heard from the leader of the opposition. We cannot let some of what he said pass, Mr. Speaker. It is remarkable what the aftermath can do to someone. It was a real bloodbath, Mr. Speaker. Because you wondered for a while whether this is the first time he's presenting himself to the people of St. Lucia and the first time he's presenting his ideas. He is regurgitating his manifesto, which was just rejected by the people of St. Lucia. Now, the reason why the manifesto was, and he, the reason why he was rejected, and he must always remember, Mr. Speaker, he is the greatest failure as a UWP leader. He even lost half of Miku too. John Compton's seat. He must never forget that. He's, there's never been, and let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, my belief, my party is a great party. We carry the social conscience of the dispossessed, the vulnerable, and it motivates every single one of us. Every single one of us. And the member from Viewfort South on Sunday said, the mystery of service, that is what propels the mystery of service from us, that commitment to that cause. But the United Workers Party has a glorious history as well. And he failed that history. He has condemned that party. He mutilated it. So said somebody who knows very much the DNA of the United Workers Party. And he was rejected one year ago. Not so much because the United Workers Party does, had not done good work in the past. Not because the manifesto did not have good ideas. They were rejected because of him. <laughs> because of him. Because he says a lot, means nothing, and cannot deliver at all. He says a lot of things. He says things and he says things and he says things. But the electorate have come to terms with him and they do not believe him. Do not believe him. So today, he is soft spoken. Today. And he's trying to be six months, six months like. Trying to be. And he drops his voice and I have to be straining to even hear what he is saying. Because he doesn't want people to see the aggressive side. But he is what he is. Because this is the same individual who's today speaking about young people and the vulnerable and all the things they can do. But he called them mendicants. He called them jackasses and parking dogs. Remember what he said about single mothers? Remember what he said about our patrimony? The same country today is talking about making great. What did he say about our patrimony? What did he say about colonialism? But today, in the aftermath, the bloodbath, he's trying to resuscitate himself. And he's coming soft-spoken, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and, and Mr. Speaker, and he's going on and on, on and on and on, ideas after ideas, and spewing it out. You never believe this is somebody who's been in politics before. And then he says to us, if this is your flagship, how did you take one year to present it? And Mr. Speaker, you would never believe he had been prime minister for five years. What happened to all the ideas you presented? Couldn't you not have done it in five years? Could you not have done it in five years? But then you are chastising us for now presenting the youth economy after one year. And you remember during his term, when he realized he was just talking and traveling, talking and traveling, he said, I need two terms. I need two terms. I can't do it in one term. Philip J.P. has never asked for two terms. 
Never. But after one year, Philip J.P. has presented a flagship initiative. He didn't say, give me another thumb for me to come with it. Tell me one flagship program that the member from Microsoft presented during his time. Not one, Mr. Speaker. Let, let me tell you how he cannot escape who he is. And the member from Sosa, the sooner you accept that reality, the better it will be for you. And I saw you clapping, and it's disappointing. Because he speaks about the glorious idea that he has for Sunday Beach. And how it is going to be cut up and St. Lucians would own pieces of Sandy Beach. But we have copies of the DSH agreement, supplementary agreement, granting DSH rights to Sandy Beach. Did he forget that? Did he forget it? Or does he think we are so stupid we cannot even come to terms with the contradictions in what he's saying? Tell me, you sign a supplementary agreement giving the beach to, to DSH. Of course, there were people who decided they would not support it. Because remember, they were going to join Maria Island to Sandy Beach and build skyscrapers. There were people that tried seeing the public reaction to divert it away from this and did their own little invest and lose your business down there. Something that will probably come to, to, to be decided you know, at a later date with the SH. Did he forget that? That he actually presented the drawings at Royalton with what he would have done to Sandy Beach? His concept of Sandy Beach linked to Maria Island had nothing to do about locals in St. Lucia. Did he forget that? You know, then he speaks about Carnival and how they decided to make Carnival the biggest local festival. Let me tell you. A lot has been said about Carnival and, you know, what was posted on Facebook and whatnot. I can remember 1997, Damien Graves, Minister of Culture, and I remember he sang a song about it, how he went to Prime Minister Anthony for advice because people were calling him Minister of Bacchanal. And the advice Dr. Anthony gave him. And even if I didn't agree with Dr. Anthony's comment on Facebook, but you have to say he is the first Prime Minister that put a significant investment into Carnival. You cannot run away from that. And Dr. Anthony reminded me, he is the one that first put a lot of money in community carnivals, and that's true. And then today, he speaks about carnival and how they, they, he probably did say that to his cabinet, that they want to make carnival the biggest event. Um, but then I was also reminded that the reason why they put so much money in carnival was to make up for the fact that they had stopped jazz. That's the point? Yes, that's what I'm <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so imagine the member from Cassius, it also wrote the same thing on his notepad. He's putting money in carnival, had nothing to do with his love for carnival. Nothing to do with his love for carnival. It was to mask the fact that they had stopped jazz and the public was incensed about it. Now, of course, jazz is foreign music, but the jazz festival had become an indigenous product. Yes. St. Lucians owned it, and they claimed it. Back in March next year. It will be back in March next year. So, when he speaks about carnival, and you know, the effort they put into carnival, what not, I boasting about my involvement in carnival. I know a little, a few things about carnival. I know a few things about carnival. You understand? He speaks about sports clubs. My goodness, look around this room, including the member from Sozel Saltibus. We know about youth groups. We know about sports clubs in Saint Lucia. Does anyone ever heard about Alan Chastney in any earlier life part of the youth movement, the student movement, or sports clubs in St. Lucia? Seriously? Seriously? Yeah. The member from Castries North and myself were part of a group in 1985 forming a youth group in St. Lucia. I was not yet 18, I was probably about a lot younger than 18. You know? Oh, he was part of the Peace Corps. So, <laughs> no, but 
you know, we, we, we go back way back from in youth groups in St. Lucia, way back. The member from Newport South, former Prime Minister, was a cadet leader. You know, you were not a member of the cadet corps? You know, all around the stable, who has found the member from? Commander of the cadet corps. You know, the, the member from Barbono will tell you about community organizations. You know, tell you about it. And he speaks about sports clubs and his love for those things and his vision for those things. But that is the same Prime Minister who defended the Lockerbie contract of 30 odd million dollars to put artificial turf all over St. Lucia. And let me tell you, I'm not sure if it's true, but I heard the member from Strozel Saltibus said he's not allowing that to be put at Lafargue. And if he did, it's the best decision he has ever made since, since entering politics. No, I'm telling you. He won't say anything now. He won't say anything now. Because it's one of the worst decisions ever taken for sports development in St. Lucia. One of the worst decisions ever taken. And let me say something to the member from Miku South. You know, you're going to talk about, you heard the member from Cassius East speak about sports and young people in sports. You know, they have two sports in St. Lucia that we are globally competitive in. Two. Now, some people may disagree with me, but I've spent many years in sports management, local, regional, international. I can tell you two. The average 15-year-old batsman in St. Lucia can be among the best in the world. The last two captains of the West Indies and the 19 team were St. Lucians. A 15-year-old in sprinter in St. Lucia can be among the best in the world, as we've seen recently with Julian Alfred. The average 15-year-old swimmer in St. Lucia is not among the best in the world. The average 15-year-old basketballer is not among the best in the world. The average 15-year-old soccer player is not among the best in the world. I'm not saying they cannot be a St. Lucian who can be among the best, but I'm talking about our stock, our genes, our DNA, our culture. There are two sports we are world-class and competitive with because right now, young Akim Ogis Young batsman. I'm one of the best in the world. You understand? So if you're going to talk about you wanting to nurture and look at, he doesn't like cricket. No, because we play cricket. Yeah, yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, so when he starts to talk and he, he spews all those theories and all those figures, there's no substance behind it. And he's not been able to deliver when he was prime minister, which is why he was rejected. Well, one of the reasons. Yeah, he's probably flying too much. Then Mr. Speaker, he speaks about community tourism. And I really did not want to go there. I really did not. And I see the member from Ancillary Canary shaking his head. I really did not want to go there because I made a promise to myself and I spoke to the Prime Minister and I know he always tells us about setting the right tone in the country, the right tone in the country. And he speaks about community tourism and what it intended to be and what not. The same Prime Minister allowed the use of millions of dollars and did a village tourism for purposes other than village tourism. Other. In ancillary canneries, almost a million dollars was approved to put lights on the Jackman playing field. And a community, a village tourism project. Mon monies went, let me tell you. But he comes and he masquerades about community tourism and village tourism and what it is supposed to be. Five years, this idea for community tourism did not start with the last United Workers Party government. And that Dr. Anthony, with Lon Fiofilas as minister, those elements were already been discussed. And even before that, but you were heritage tourism. So this is an improvement on it. But you're going to speak after five years. You could not even get it going but you want to talk about it as if it's your glorious idea? Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, the member from Miku South, you know, need to understand that the people made a decision in 2016. Some of us may not have liked it, but they made a decision. And they've corrected the course. They've corrected the course. And this snake oil salesman performances must end at some point in time. And maybe we'll wait for when the internal fight settle and see where he will be 
in the hierarchy of the party, and I wish you well. I wish you well. But I will leave you to your own machinations, and you will see what's coming to you. And like I told you, some of us on this side suffered long and hard, and we are on this side now, serving the people of St. Lucia and putting them first. But let's go on to the youth economy, Mr. Speaker, unless you tell me to speak to the bill. So let, let, let's focus. I want you, Mr. Speaker, to just bear with me and just focus on what a youth, what an economy is. And like I said, I'm no economist. So I will speak in very simplistic terms, very simplistic terms. An economy, and as it relates to youth, are activities that are youth related to production, consumption, and the trade in goods and services. So think about it. Activities that are related to production, consumption, and trading in goods and services. So if you think of a youth economy, you're thinking about a series of activities in the country that involve production of goods and services, consumption of goods and services, and trade in goods and services. And they center around the characteristics of youth. So if you think about it, there are regional economies, community economies, you know, international economy that we all, the global economy we exist in. But there are some things that are unique to young people that can constitute an economic space, and that means a series of activities. So you won't really expect in the youth economy people are involved in real estate. You won't really expect that because that's not a youth characteristic. But fashion would be because young people are heavily involved in fashion. So fashion can constitute a series of activities that will be part of a youth economy. Music. You, you won't expect retirement needs to be part of that because young people are not retired. So when you start thinking about young people and what they constitute, you can start thinking of all the activities that they would be involved in that relate to production, consumption, and trade. But importantly, and that is where they are missing the point, we're not talking in a very narrow sense. We're not talking about youth as an economic asset in labor relations, working, or productive capacity, having a job. We're not talking about youth as an asset. We're talking of youth not just as an object, but as a subject. So it's about young people involved in a series of activities, not just giving them skills, not just talking about youth enterprise, not just talking about giving them a job. So when you start talking about youth economy, you're talking about a series of activities that young people can engage in. It's not just about giving a young person a job. That's why all the agencies, that's why all what existed before are necessary but not sufficient. There's a difference between something being necessary and what is necessary and sufficient. They, you have to, they have to understand that. Those things are necessary, but they're not sufficient. And I have my favorite example I always give. And I say to our young people, think about it. Just think about it. And the Prime Minister used modeling and fashion. In February, we have independence. Then we're going to have jazz. We're going to have carnival. We're going to have Creole Heritage Month. So just imagine, as part of that youth economy, there is a deliberate and conscious effort by the agency to say, look, let us train um, designers so they can start understanding textiles. They can start understanding cloth and clothing and cuts. And they are trained on that. They can design. We train seamstresses that are young people and tailors. So, they, so when one design, one can produce, then the models can take it and the models can go on the runway and show off the, the clothing and the fashion for those upcoming festivals. And then they can have entrepreneurs, pop-up shops in the boulevard, in Viewfort, in Soufre, selling the fashion. So for four times a year, our young models can look forward to runways and modeling shows. We can have modeling shows in Viewfort and Soufre. 
we can have seen stresses throughout the country. Let me tell you, at the export runway which we attended recently, some of you did not attend, when they were presenting the designers from Forza Jacques, from Kako, from Derisso, from all over St. Lucia, and the quality of their product was a sight to behold. St. Lucians. So think in that youth economy construct, you're training seamstresses, you're training designers, you're training models, you provide support for those who want to be entrepreneurs. Those series of activities, production, consumption, and then exposed St. Lucia will take the best of it and export it to Trinidad and Jamaica and other parts of the world, trading goods and services. Just think about it. That's youth economy. It's not just about a singular activity. That's what has been existing. We want to be qualitatively better than that. that that's what it is about. So when one speaks about the youth economy, remember always, it is not just about training young people and say, we give you all training, we have booths, we have this, we give you training, or we create, we have low, um, a micro bank. The member from Microsoft spoke about a micro bank. No, we need more than that. It is not a micro bank. Because you are seeing youth through an outdated category of thinking. Youth, the youth economy is an out, in your head, member from Microsoft, you don't get it. For us, the youth economy agency is about creating the series of activities that young people can engage in and activities that are characteristic of young people. It, you know, we want to talk about the hobbies uh, and the, the, the pastimes, translating that into economic activity. So for four times in the year, we'll be having runways. We'll be having, I, I'm already looking for my, my, my Creole Heritage Man shirt. I want one. I, you know, I, so somebody has to design it for me. I want to know I can go in the boulevard and there'll be pop-up, you know, things where I can go and buy my shirt. I can probably have one for each major activity for the month. That's creating the youth economy. That involves a seamstress, a designer, a model who models it, and an entrepreneur who sells it in tongue. That is youth economy. It's not just training. It's not the replication of another training agency. It's not that. It's not that. It is the series of activities that we will organize. We speak about you know, mentorship. We talk about training in, in, in financing, in marketing. It's the series of activities. It's about creating for young people an economic space that is distinctively suited to them and reflective of them and their aspirations and their dreams. That's what it is about. It's not about another agency. And anybody who thinks, oh, we have agencies giving loans, so why y'all want another agency? It's not an agency giving loans. It's an agency that is bringing everything together, all the necessary components and making it a sufficient output. That's what it is about. And I want the member from Miku South to stop. I was about to use a word, I'm, but you might put me out if I use it. You know, he needs to stop, stop that nonsense, Mr. Speaker. Elevate the discourse. There are people in St. Lucia who can see through you. Go on those days. You know. So I am excited about this youth economy. I'm excited about it. I have been excited about it for years. I've been dreaming about it for years. This is a qualitative improvement on ideas that started long before. And the member from Cassius North will tell you, some of, some of those things we've spoken about as youth leaders, but we now see in the crystallization of those dreams and aspirations, a government stepping in. We've not invested in our young people sufficiently in this country. We've not done it. We've not done it. People see, and the member from Miku South once said it in this very chamber, he looked at students from Sir Afa, and he said to them basically, how much government is spending on Sir Afa? You know, almost suggesting, you know, you're spending so much money on y'all and whatnot. And I had to say to him, do my thing, when we spend on youth, we are investing in a better future. 
when we spend on you, if we are invested in a better future. And that's how we must see our young people. And I said it this morning, we failed our young people in St. Lucia. When I was a youth, we were failing youth. My generation is failing youth. Because we are not making youth a priority in this country. This youth economy project is about starting to correct those failings of the past and the present. It's about making young people a priority in this country, putting them at the center of national development. That's what it is about. And I want to see it succeed. And I know the Prime Minister, I, I was a little unhappy, I must tell you. But when I saw the allocation in the estimates for youth economy, and I look at what creative industries is getting, I was like, PM, oh, what's going on? You know, you could have taken a little less and, and thing. And I know there's, you know, and you know what, what the member from Castries, he said to me, you know, he said to me, you know, um, we can always, you know, we can always do creative industries under the youth economy. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, see, he, I, I kept quiet because he gave me a good explanation. But I know, in other words, you see, boss, you know. But it showed you his commitment to the youth economy idea, his commitment to it. That he, need, he wanted to see it started, and he was going to put in the resources to get it started. And I'm happy he did. This is an investment in our young people. This morning we passed a bill, firearms amendment, where we will be very severe in our treatment of persons with firearms. Today, today is the other side of the coin. We are putting a significant amount of money to make the future better for the young people. That's what it is about. That's what it is about. The possibilities will be limitless. And I heard the member from Miku South say a lot of things. A lot, a lot of things. And like I said, he will face his own destiny. He has. I think it will get a lot worse for him. So, Mr. Speaker, and whilst he is sinking to the bottom of the ocean, the young people will be rising to touch those stars that are above us. The aspirations, the inspiration of the stars above us will always lift up our spirits. And despite all that we've gone through, our people will prosper. Our young people will be so happy when this project finally gets its full implementation. And I know we will have a better St. Lucia. I know it. And when you complement it with creative industries, you complement it with so many other initiatives, Mr. Speaker, our dream is to make that St. Lucia a better place for all. Where we can say to our young people, take on the world. And you can take on the world with confidence because you've been prepared in St. Lucia for taking on that world. I know I had my own dreams as a young man sitting down on the bridge. No, I wanted to work in London and New York and Paris, things you were seen on television. I had my dreams too, and a lot of young people, just like me where I came from, have those dreams and aspirations too. And the Labour Party will help deliver their dreams and aspirations to them. And in each of our constituencies, we have young people that dream of taking on the world. And between the youth economy, the creative industries, exports and Lucia, we will transport our young people from the playing fields, the blocks, to the highest levels they can reach. Wherever in the world they will roam. But wherever they roam, St. Lucia will always be their island home. And the St. Lucia Labour Party is taking all the necessary steps to deliver that. And this bill today, Mr. Speaker, is along that journey. And I'm glad to be part of it and to support it. Thank you very much. Minister for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have not, I do not have much to say, Mr. Speaker, after the presentations by my colleagues. I want to thank them. I want to thank the 
explanation given by the members in different... Let me just speak up. The, the presentation this afternoon, it shows the depth and the degree of consistency and the different styles, Mr. Speaker, from members on the side. You heard the member for Cass Trees Southeast, Mr. Speaker, with his twist of people's empowerment, equity, seen about the under, the less privileged, Mr. Speaker. Then you heard the member for Vifort North with his creativity, his love for the, for the arts, his eloquence, Mr. Speaker, and putting it almost like a poem, as he did in the church on Sunday, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> then you heard the, minister, the member for Labry, Mr. Speaker, with his, a mixture of his knowledge of the science, his knowledge of flying, and put it all together, Mr. Speaker, and making, making us understand what this bill is about. But before, you heard the member from Miku, Miku North, with targeted simplicity, reaching out from his own experience, and explaining how the bill could have helped him and will help others who do not have the opportunity to do what he did with his life, Mr. Speaker. And this member for, for, for Miku North, you must always compliment him because he never felt sorry for himself. And, and this is something we say to, to young people all the time. Never feel sorry for yourself. Don't be a victim. When I speak to, to the, the, the guys on the block, I say, <coughs> boss man, nothing here running. I say, stop being a victim. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Rise up. And this is what he did, Mr. Speaker. This is why he did. And then the member for Cash Resolve, Mr. Speaker, who put in the intellectual understanding rooted in experience and rooted in experience from the youth movement and rooted in the intellectual understanding of what you're doing today. So this is a, the combination of men and women. And then you heard Auntie Emma. The member for Sufra. And Mr. Speaker, I, I, say, I say Auntie Emma because I remember a joke. I was sitting on that side of the house. You know, because the member for Vivo South and I, we have sat on both sides. Both sides. He sat there already, and I sat where, where you are, yeah, next to him. And then he sat here, and I sat here. You sit on both sides of the house. So you, we understand where it is. And then there was a, a, a gentleman who, sit, who sat down there, Mr. Speaker. And they gave him a text to read. And for 46 <coughs> minutes, and 30 seconds. <laughs> he said the most obscene and vile things about me. Vile. And I said to him, you see you? You're not coming back here. And he laughed. He said, who, 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 who are you thinking about? Auntie Emma? Auntie Emma? So that's why I'm laughing at Auntie Emma. But you heard... You, yes, you're right. <laughs> so you heard... The member for Sufre, and you heard she's a, a trained person, and you heard her express herself, Mr. Speaker. So, it is this youth economy, Mr. Speaker, this youth economy bill. I want to make the point that what the members are speaking of are programs, a program, but this is legislation, it is law, it is embedded in the law of the country, and this is different. We're not talking about programs, boosts, they might be good, you know, we're talking about law. We're putting in the law of the country a space for the young people of this country, an economic space which we call the youth economy. It's a law. It's different to everything else you're doing. It's law. And it's the first time that we are legislating, telling young people you can go in the statistical books and there's a law that relates to your development. It's the first time. I mean, just because, and this has created so much excitement. In the Castries North constituency, we went to an, 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 an exhibition on Sunday. 
some Sundays ago. And you could see the talent, the number of, of booths that were there displaying all kinds of talent. They are anticipating because they are saying to themselves, and the member for Answer Can, Mr. Speaker, who again, his style was very gentle and mild, Mr. Speaker, and that is a style that they underestimate. This, they underestimate. And I can assure you, all those who underestimate him in answering canneries, they'll be surprised at the next election. <laughs> but because they underestimated him, you know. Again, there was one that was, that's, that's not too tall. All kind of, <laughs> all kind of aspersions on the guy's character. All kind of things, Mr. Speaker. You know, these guys, they really insulted us, you know. I mean, this was hurtful. The, the, one day they, they, call, they call him little boy, shut up boy, shut up. You know, Mr. Speaker, you don't want to be, don't be harsh. But sometimes you must disclose these things because you see how life turns around. And I remember telling them all the time, four years is not 40 years. And they laughed at me, Mr. Speaker. So we, what, what I'm saying to you, Mr. Speaker, is that you saw the youth in Castries North with the exhibition showing off what they can produce, Mr. Speaker. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, the youth economy is, dif is a different concept, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to say two things. That's not the first time I've been, I'm hearing from the honorable members over there that we did something about Ojo Labs and Naps. Let me tell you the story of Naps, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, do you know we allow the NAPS program to continue. We kept the manager, we kept him until, and this is, must be said, the manager, we kept him until his contract expired. The rest of the people in that program, Mr. Speaker, there was one of them, Mr. Speaker, who every night, she said the vilest things about me on social media. The vilest things about me. And she kept, we never touched her. We left her there until a contract expired, Mr. Speaker. But what the minister, the member, minister, I was telling you, is they left a bill for us, for Ojo Labs, of nearly half a million dollars, which we settled, which we are settling. So we kept the staff and we paid the bills. And it comes back to what he, he spoke about when he spoke about Monroe College and the Initiative for International Hospitality Training. I have an email that says he left owing $429,000 to Monroe for what he's speaking about. So he said about these things and refused to pay them and left us with the burden, Mr. Speaker. Monroe College, $429,000, Mr. Speaker. Then, then, so, Mr. Speaker, so he comes and he speaks about these things glibly, Mr. Speaker, very glibly. He started all these programs, started them, and left us, left it in debt, and left it in debt, Mr. Speaker, and left us to pay, which we are paying. Which we are paying, Mr. Speaker. Among many other debts, Mr. Speaker. Then he speaks about the. the Let me talk about it. 12 million dollars. And he won Nora International. He won Nora International Airport. Cost overruns. Cost overruns on the, on the foundation. Cost overruns on the foundation. 767 pairs according to the plan. And you put in 3,000. And nine pairs, Mr. Speaker. Cost overruns of over $40 million in the foundation of a project. On the foundation of a project. So, Mr. Speaker, so when you hear, when you hear these things, Mr. Speaker, when you hear these these discussions, these are facts, Mr. Speaker. These are facts. Based on the, these are facts, yes. Going up in the airport and just changing the site. Just telling them, put this building there. Yeah. Eh? 3,000 piles for a plant of 767. 43 million dollars of cost overruns. That's the burden on the taxpayers of this country, Mr. Speaker. That's the burden. On the foundation. Elevated and elevated. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker. Then, Mr. Speaker, we speak about different, different organizations. Mr. Speaker, we we. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> and you hear Mr. Speaker, you know, we have to discuss these things, Mr. Speaker. Then, you, then you, he, he speaks about the St. Michel Development Bank. Mr. Speaker, I, stand, I stood there, yeah. there, and I said to them, if you are bringing back the St. Michel Development Bank, it's your, it's your policy, we, the mem member from V4 South, I speak, he spoke first at the ring, he made the point that he doesn't think that the development bank should come back undercapitalized. I said to them, if it's your policy, do your bank. That's your policy, the people, because I, I accept when the people make a decision. He passed his bill for the <coughs> development bank. He was the one who said it up, you know. Refused to capitalize it. Refuse the potential bank. We are selling by United Coast Party, yes. Yeah. And you can say, you, are, you didn't capitalize right. They did not, they did not, cap, he did not capitalize it, Mr. Speaker. It took us now to capitalize the Central Bank Bank to make it play a meaningful commission. When you reincarnated, Yes, started in the beginning, yes. Mr. Speaker, then he comes with a, a series output per acre. Now, if you're not thinking, you say, but that's a real, real serious point, you know. Output per acre. That's a brilliant, brilliant. That's a brilliant thing by Aruba, smaller than St. Lucia, output per area. Singapore, smaller than St. Lucia, output per area. And Barbados, output per area. And you say, and you sing. And you say, really, what is he talking about? Oh, Mr. Speaker, Aruba is a very flat country, very flat. Barbados is extremely flat. St. Lucia, the topography is different. So the output per acre in these countries must be more because they have more development space. Very simple. In Barbados and, and, and Antigua, Antigua has 265 beaches. St. Lucia, we have limited beach space because a lot of our country is hilly. So we have to make use of the hills. But don't talk about, but output is not a proper statistic. But they have nothing for output per acre. But even though they have one, is that right? <laughs> output, output per acre. How you, Aruba is a flat you country. You Aruba is a very flat country. So how you come about, so Aruba must have more output per acre for buildings because it's a flatter country. So what's the point? But you know, these things sound good. These things sound nice. And if you're not thinking, you say, well, that man is a real serious fellow, you know. That man have good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> that man have good plans. But you know, that's what I've always told solutions. Listen carefully when politicians speak. Listen. Listen. You understand? Output per acre. Then he speaks about, always makes a point about St. Lucia. But that's the same member who was on television saying that one thing the government should do is remove VAT on electricity. He said, and I think some of them, another one echoed the same thing, but in, in a different way. He said part of the measures the government should take to stem the problem is remove VAT on electricity. My members of parliament, I'll give you my whole salary. If you show me one electricity bill, it will not show you VAT in it. But, but these are the things. You on pub, and then I can play it for you in, in, on my phone, you know. You were on public media saying that the government should remove VAT on electricity because you heard it said in Barbados. <laughs> I mean, even you can do that, man. 
<laughs> you think it was deliberate? Deliberate. Because you know what happens? When he says so, he'll get some people say, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. You see, they must take out fat electricity. This is what the government is doing. You know, sink in a body. <laughs> but he knows it's not true, you know. He knows it's not true. I there is, right? He knows not <clears throat> there is no electricity on vat, no on water. But, but, uh, then he goes and then comes it and talks about um, we must remove import duty on food stuff. He knows very well that St. Lucia has the most items that are zero rated or have vat exempt. He knows that because the IMF tells him that all the time. But you know, just to cast as portions and not to admit that we is living different, he says so. Then he says something else. He says that government must take some of the revenue that they make from, from what he says? From the CIP to pay this and that. That's what he says. He knows very well, Mr. Speaker, that fuel, the fuel tax, one of the most secure revenue streams for the government of St. Lucia. And he also knows that because of the cost of fuel, the revenue stream from fuel is sometimes zero or minimal. But he also knows that we must meet all the expenses without that revenue stream, and he has borrowed everything he could borrow under the COVID relief program. He knows that. He knows that, Mr. Speaker. 800 million. In one year, he borrowed 329 million dollars. And when we came in July 17th, July 26th, we only had 19 million dollars to spend. And we, and we did not borrow any money except going in the, in the RSM. Mr. Yeah. So, this, Mr. Speaker, but it's important. And, 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 and a friend of mine says to me, I should not respond to these things. <clears throat> but you know, it's that non-response that makes people believe these things. Because these things sound good, especially when you say different accents. <laughs> it sounds very good, Mr. Speaker. But you know, they say I stammering, so I rather. But this, when it, this, these things, you say these things, but I must put the holes in these things, because people believe it. Today, today, we give pensioners their $500. <clears throat> Not too much, but at least we showed an indication we want to assist them in the plight, a tangible way to assist them, Mr. Speaker. Today, the NIC decided that, among other things, they would give an increase in pensions to all the pensioners, Mr. Speaker. These are tangible things the government is doing to assist. But the government cannot continue if something else doesn't happen. Right now, 14% of our expenses are used to pay debts. You understand? And salaries and wages. St. Lucia has and the ECCB proved that yesterday, they, they showed that St. Lucia has the highest wages and salaries bill in the entire EC, ECCU region. Over 40% is used to pay salaries and wages. But still for that, we still pay the civil servants their 1% increase in spite of that, and we're going to pay them their back pay in December. Something that the glass government negotiated, they could not do it but we are going to pay it, Mr. Speaker. So, so it's not easy. You did not do it. So it's not easy, Mr. Speaker. So what I'm saying to the member from Mikosov is hold your horse. Take your time. You went and you lost Miku North. Miku North. You presided over a party that lost Miku North. The late Sir John must be turning in his grave. He must be turning his grave for you to preside over party and lose Miku North. And why is that? Because he was campaigning in Bagatelle. <laughs> Coming after me. Anyhow, Mr. Speaker. The U <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, the youth economy, Mr. Speaker, is 
is a model piece of legislation, the first of its kind, <laughs> which legislates a space for young people. And it's just the beginning, Mr. Speaker. We put in $10 million now, and again, the member from Mucus South said, that's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. He said that this, if we see this, this is a microbank, did not even read, did not even read, Mr. Speaker, did not even, not, did not even read the law, the legislation. That's what you said, eh? <laughs> let me let me tell you something. Go to town, go to town, and call your name and call my name and say like you, you whatever you say. <laughs> let's, let's go. Say, you and I walk to town. Let's go now. Anybody, just say like and you see what the point is. <laughs> Challenge. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Talk about lie. <laughs> Let's make a wrong in tongue. Let's go by that. Anyway, by that. Let's go by that. We, by that. that. <laughs> we, go, we, have, we have a scene by that. Let's go there. Let's go by that. And just say like. They say, you, 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 you. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker. Finally, Mr. Speaker. The Youth Economy Agency, Mr. Speaker. Will, will be positioned as the premier agency devoted to young entrepreneurs in St. Lucia. It will help create and develop strong youth businesses through financing, advisory services, and capital with a focus on micro-business. The youth economy su supports young entrepreneurs as indicated in the industries that they like. And remember, in modeling, in sports, in creative industries, it will support young, young entrepreneurs at all stages of development while working in collaboration with business centers across St. Lucia. It will not be in isolation, it will work in collaboration with them, Mr. Speaker. It's committed to long term success of young entrepreneurs, and the Youth Ec Economy Agency understands that a business is just more than dollars and cents, it's about linkages. It's about creating synergies. That's what it's all about. Not only about dollars and cents, Mr. Speaker. And it complements, and that's, that's it, many of us show them, it will complement the role played by private sector financial institutions. So when, in the youth economy, we'll do the training, we will do, we'll do the training, we will do the mentoring, and if there are a certain, a certain situation, we can move can get assistance from other private sector organizations. That's what it's all about. It's about creating that, that, these synergies, creating that atmosphere for young people, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, on, the, on, on our one-year anniversary, on our one-year anniversary, Mr. Speaker, we are, I'm very proud, with the support of the members of, of this side, Mr. Speaker, to have this bill in the, in the, in the House of Assembly. As we speak, we are preparing the building, Mr. Speaker. We are preparing the building for the Youth Economy Office, Mr. Speaker. And it's a building that have a lot of vibe. It's a building that will be for young people. It's a building that will make young people feel it will be, it'll be a technologically advanced building. For young, people can, for young people to, because you know, we need to make young people understand that they have value. Right? We pass the Firearms Act to punish those who violate the law. But this will have value, Mr. Speaker. So we are in the process of, of preparing the building, of outfitting the building. Then we will go into the process of appointing the board. Then we will begin actual operations, Mr. Speaker. And as you said, your people from Shozel, that is not in our DNA. We are not people who discriminate. You know that. And sometimes in previous life, when the member of Vifort South was Prime Minister and he spoke about equity. Equity meant equity for everybody in, in the country. So we, we're not like you. Not like your party. We don't discriminate. We do not do it. And that is why you are soon going to get your allocation for your school education this year. As you got last year which is more than you can say for us, Mr. Speaker. Because in, in, our, in my entire period, one, 
Vivot South, Cassius South, Labri, Mikunov, then we know the speaker. We did not get one cent from this government for any program in our constituency. Not one cent, Mr. Speaker. Not one cent for any for any personal constituency for the development. But we, we, we are not like that, so you'll get your fair share of the youth economy. But you know, but these things have a way of coming back to haunt you. Because I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, do you know last year, nine o'clock by this time, there was celebration in St. Lucia? Nine, yeah, I didn't realize that. Nine o'clock, Mr. Speaker, the town had been painted red at nine o'clock. Red and in some places blue. <laughs> at nine o'clock, Mr. Speaker, nine o'clock last year, the town was in blue, was in red, Mr. Speaker. Nine o'clock last year, nine o'clock. And Mr. Speaker, by this year, let's go by, let's go by that. Let's go there. Let's go and, and let's say lie, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. I thank you very much, and again, I want to thank my colleagues and thank the people of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> the times are challenging, but it's exciting. And the youth, the young people of St. Lucia know that the government has a plan for them to improve their lives and to create sustainable employment for them. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, the question is that the youth economy bill be read a second time. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. An act to provide young people an economic space to turn hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills into businesses. To establish the Youth Economy Agency for the Youth Economy Program to facilitate the development of a youth economy project and provide special incentives for related matters. Clause two. Interpretation. Clause two stands part of the bill. Aye. Part one, clauses three to 45. Youth Economy Agency. Part one, clauses three to 45, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part two, clauses 46 to 50. Youth Economy Program. Part two, clauses 46 to 50, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part three, clauses 51 to 57. Tax relief and exemptions. Part three, clauses 51 to 57, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part four, clauses 58 to 61. Miscellaneous. Part four, clauses 58 to 61, stands part of the bill. Aye. Schedule one. Section two. Section two. Hmm? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, there's, after activity, there's trading, and add one, technology. Come. Schedule, Schedule one. Uh -huh. Page 37. Uh -huh. Add one activity, one activity. Technology will carry IT and everything. So that's 14? That's 14, yeah. Technology. What? Yeah. Add it to the activity. Schedule one as amended stands part of the bill. Aye. 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 Schedule two. Section 54.3A. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Schedule 2 stands part of the bill. Clause 1. Short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Aye. 
Honourable Members, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. As many as have that opinion, say aye. 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 As many as have a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honourable members, I beg to report that the youth economy went through committee with amendments to Schedule 1. Finance Minister. Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be adopted and the bill be read a third time and passed. Honourable members, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the youth economy bill be read a third time and passed. I now put the question, as many as that opinion, say aye. 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 As many are, as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The eyes have it. Be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This act may be... Sorry, I put it off accidentally. This act may be cited as the Youth Economy Act 2022. Leader of Government Business. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I move that this House stand adjourned until Tuesday, August 9th. Honourable Members, the question is that this House do stand adjourned until Tuesday, August 9th at 10 o'clock in the forenoon. And I'll put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Sitting adjourned. Well, this sit-in of the St. Lucia House of Assembly today, Tuesday the 26th, has now come to an end and uh, has been adjourned to August the 9th, Tuesday, August the 9th. Today we saw the passage of four bills, the recording of court proceedings, the Eastern Caribbean Securities Regulatory Commission Agreement, the Firearms Amendment, the Youth Economy Agency, and, well, that's what was passed today. They have deferred the Special Prosecutor's um, Bill for the 9th of August. Also today we heard from the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance that the $500 payment, one-off payment to government pensioners which will cost the government $1.5 million, is now in the bank and is being paid out. And the National Insurance Corporation has agreed to pay 4.2%, a payment increase to NIC pensioners of 4.2%, which will cost the NIC $4 million. And this will be retroactive as of July 1st, 2022. And the 1% salary increase to the public servants, which will cost government 4.5 million yearly, is and or will be paid. So until August the 9th, and before I go, I would like to encourage you to go get a copy of the new firearms licensing bill, which, like I said before, was also passed today. Fireman, the firearms amendment. It is a very interesting bill and one that all firearms license holders, holders and others should read because of the crime situation in St. Lucia. The government has taken some initiatives to arrest the problems that we are 
at the moment undergoing with firearms on the island, the increase in illegal firearms on the island. And you should get a copy of that um, legislation which was passed today in the House. So from the St. Lucia House of Assembly until August the 9th, I am Winston Springer saying goodbye. Have a pleasant night's rest and a good day tomorrow. Good night, everyone.